Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Commissioners. We're an advisory board to the elected officials. So you should know that any of the issues before us tonight will go to the governing body. They will have the final say on the issues uh, before they become final. If you wish to speak on an item this evening, there's a table to my left and your right. We encourage you to come and sign up. Please look for the specific case number that you'd like to speak on. You can put down your name, your address, and let us know if you're speaking for the proposal or against the proposal. Each side will get 10 minutes per side to speak during the public comment period and the, pub the public hearing, which we will open on each case. And the time will be divided between the number of people on each side. Uh, finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative. So if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. So thanks again. And may we have a roll call, please? Yes, you can, Chair Busby. Um, Commissioner Williams? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Bryan? Present. Commissioner Durkin? Here. Commissioner Alturk? Here. Commissioner Hyman? Present. Commissioner Busby? Here. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner Keenshim? Here. Excuse me. Um, Commissioner Satterfield? Uh, Commissioner um, Satterfield asked for an excused absence. Did. Mm -hmm. You requested an excused absence. Um, Commissioner Hornbuckle? Present. Commissioner Baker? Here. And Commissioner Gibbs? Here. And would you like a motion for the, um... I move an excused absence for Commissioner Satterfield. Seconded. Second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Brine and seconded by uh, Commissioner Morgan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We now have the approval of the, oh, actually, we, do we have minutes for approval? I don't think we do. No. We don't have any ready for you just yet, so they'll come at your next meeting. So a little too close together. That's fine. Uh, any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Staff does not have any adjustments. However, we would like to state for the record that all legal notice requirements have been met and carried out in accordance with state and local law and affidavits for such are on file in the planning department. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. second. <laughs> moved by Commissioner Bryan. We'll give the second to Commissioner Al Turk. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So we will move to our first agenda item this evening. So the first item is a future land use map amendment and a concurrent zoning map change. This is case a170018 and Z170052, the Ellis Road Phase 3 project. And we'll start with the staff report. Good evening, Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z170018 
1700052 Ellis Road, Phase 3. <clears throat> the applicant is Patrick, Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. The property in total is approximately 135 acres and generally located at 3714 Angier Avenue. <clears throat> it, is, it is currently within the county's, uh, excuse me, it is currently within the county limits with an associated annexation application. The request includes a FLAM amendment from industrial to low density residential for the entire track and a rezoning request from industrial light and rural residential to plan development residential 3.575, DDR 3575, <clears throat> for approximately 73% of the area. The applicant has submitted a development plan for up to 350 residential units. The entire track is highlighted here. I'm sorry, the area above this should also be highlighted. The entire track is highlighted here with the southern area hatched being the portion which is the rezoning part. The area above the hatched below Glover Road is the area that's also proposed plan amendment. The site is located within the suburban development tier and the Noose and Cape River, uh, Cape Fear River Basin. Um, these uh, photos show the existing conditions of the site and also the surrounding area. Um, the not just under 100 acre parcel of land is um, vacant, undeveloped, and there are areas of steep slopes, intermittent and perennial streams, wetlands, a 50 foot um, wide public service easement, and a 30 foot wide sanitary sewer easement. Along Glover Road, Esther Drive, and Crafton Street, there are resident, uh, there are homes as well as vacant parcels uh, within the county jurisdiction. An active rail corridor lies east of the property, and the Durham Freeway is on the west side. Most of the southern property line borders a transfer station for waste industries, and the west and the rest is um, bordered by Ellis Road residential project. This is the zoning context map. On the left, you see that the property is in the rural residential zoning district, which is in yellow, and then the purple shade um, is in the um, uh, light industrial. And the property, um, the, the depiction on the right shows the parcel in the planned development residential 3.575 shade, which is blue. This is the future land use map. Um, existing on the left is the uh, industrial shade, and on the right, it's highlighted in yellow, which is low density residential four dwelling units or less, which would be consistent with what the applicant is asking in terms of the rezoning. This map shows the proposed conditions of the development plan. Uh, with the project boundary buffers, um, the riparian areas, the riparian crossings, uh, the building and parking envelope, as well as um, the uh, landscape buffers. In terms of the um, text commitments, the maximum number of residential units on the development plan will not exceed 350. The maximum pervious surface will not exceed 70%. There are a number of transportation related uh, text commitments on the development plan associated with this project, um, Ellis uh, Road Phase 3, as well as Ellis, phase, um, Ellis Road Phase 2. And I've just highlighted a couple here. Um, there are the graphic commitments, uh, as you saw from the last slide, include um, site access points, the building envelopes, project boundary buffers, the stream crossings. Um, and uh, there are a number of design commitments related to the building style, roof materials, and the architectural features of the buildings. In terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan, the proposed PDR zoning designation does not comply with the current industrial designation on the future land use map. Um, however, it is consistent with policy 231D as a low density residential development for the 100 acre track is consistent with the neighboring Ellis Road phase two development and the Ellis Crossing residential development. 
and it serves as an expansion to the residential um, patterns in the area. The low density residential uh, designation for the area south of Glover Road along Esther Drive and Crafton Street is also consistent as it reflects the nature of the existing homes in that area. And it's not expected that it, that area become um, or develop as industrial. With respect to 231A, if approved, the request would permit up to 350 residential units at the site. Uh, the proposal supports or orderly development as a, it is surrounded by residential zoning to the north, west, and south. Um, there is existing infrastructure, roads, water, and sewer uh, sufficient to accommodate the potential impacts. And with respect to 812H, the applicant has addressed this policy since they have not met the 110 uh, percent threshold and the TIA identified various transportation mitigation measures that the applicant has addressed. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you Ms. Sonyak. We will open the public hearing. We have three individuals signed up to speak in support. Patrick Biker, Rhinel Stevenson and Heather Schaefer. Heather's for Davis Park West, sorry. I'm sorry? Heather's for Davis Park West, oh. sorry. She okay, might have great, thank you. Wrong one, but. All right. And, and let me add that if you have arrived after the sign-up sheet was brought up here and you would like to speak, uh, we will open it up for additional people once we get through the folks who have signed up in advance. Mr. Biker. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Patrick Biker. I'm with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here tonight representing Ellis Road, WEHLP, for Ellis Road Phase 3. Along with me tonight are Rhinel Stevenson, our traffic engineer, uh, Stephen Dorn with McAdams, our site uh, designer, and Eric Rifkin, the Assistant Vice President for Ellis Road, WEH. This agenda item that's before you this evening represents the last 100 acre phase of a master plan development that consists of commercial, apartments, townhouses, and single family detached housing within a, within a new 350 acre neighborhood for Durham. The apartments along Ellis Road are built and fully leased up. The commercial sites are ready to go. And the other residential sections are approved and moving forward with construction. With the minor exception of allowing vinyl siding to promote housing affordability, the design commitments for phase three that you are considering tonight are the same as the residential development for phase two. To that end, I want to state specifically on the record our proffer that the distinctive architectural features for phase three require that, quote, gabled roofs shall be composite, shingle or metal, masonry features, cement fiberboard, use of shakes and other accent materials for elevations, Traditional doors and windows and traditional Williamsburg colors shall be utilized. Units containing garages shall utilize a decorative garage door design, and this includes, but is not limited to, windows and carriage style doors, unquote. Next, it is important to note that the Ellis Road neighborhood today is providing quality housing that is affordable for folks who are sometimes referred to as the missing middle. The townhouses here are priced starting at $220,000 and the single family homes are priced starting at $280,000. Phase three will allow us to continue our strong efforts to expand the housing supply for this important market segment. And what really makes phase three important for Durham's growth, in addition to the overall neighborhood, is its central location that is convenient for commuting to downtown, Duke, or RTP. Since 20 people move to Durham every day, it is imperative to keep our housing supply increasing, especially when it is workforce housing located near our core employment centers so we are not locating new housing further away. This agenda item checks all those boxes and therefore it is a de positive development for Durham. Last of all, I want to thank Jamie for the fine staff report on this item, but I do wish to point out that the waste industry site adjacent to phases two and three that's only a recycling transfer station. Uh, it does not handle trash and garbage. And so for all these reasons, we respectfully request your recommendation of approval, and our team will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. And Mr. Stevenson? Great, thank you. 
Are there other individuals on this case who would like to speak during the public hearing? This is if you're for the project, you're against the project, you can come up. You have uh, up to 10 minutes per side. I don't see anyone else looking to speak. So I will close the public hearing. I'm sorry, sir? This, this is your moment, sir. The, the public hearing is, is still open. So if you would like to come and speak, and that can include asking a question. We do ask you come to the podium and you state your name and your address, and then you're welcome to make any remarks, including a, a question that you might have. My name is John Delargy. I'm at 3715 Esther Drive. Apparently, this is right behind my house. I'm the last house on the lot. The last time we came up to one of these things, they were looking to put a transfer station in our backyard. That transfer station was implemented it's there now. On a warm day in July, you can smell the transfer station all over the place. Are any of these people going to be told about this? Or are you going to do something about that? That's my question. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. And what we'll do, sir, we, we close the public hearing, and then the commissioners will have time to ask questions or make comments. I'm guessing your question will be raised at that point. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak during the public hearing? I don't see anyone else, sir. Okay, we have two more individuals. Please come on up. If you could both come up, actually, that'd be great, so we can keep the public hearing moving. I'm Craig Walls. I live at 3624 Crafton Street, the other end of the dead end street. Now, the only thing that really worries me is access. Y'all won't go to Glover Road. That worries me, because that road is dangerous. And they were doing projects before, and they wouldn't let them use it because that road was not built to state specification. Now, if they're going to open that up, I want to know where they're going to open it. Are they going to use our streets or only one street? I just want to be very clear, clear on that. Which access off onto Glover Road? Because it's hilly and it's, it's just not a, it's not a safe road. Uh, I mean, they talk about one access and not using ours. I just want to verify that's going to be true, if I could. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Johnson. I live at 700 Finsbury Street, and uh, I'd just like to say I am in favor of the proposed change to a mixed-use conditional, of course, on what the actual uh, uses are. Um, wrong project. Oh, this is oh, oh my. <laughs> so this is the first uh, first one. So we'll get to the others, and and actually, if if you're interested, you can sign up at the table over here. You should see the case. One more question. We're in the county. We're not in the city. Now, with all this housing around, how's it going to affect us staying in the county? I mean, that, that's a true question. They say we should not be taken in unless everybody agrees. I just want to make sure that's true. Okay, thank you. Thank, Great. you. thank you very much. And for those of you that, that did speak but weren't able to sign up, we will bring this out. This is the sign-up sheet. We can bring it out to you while we deliberate. We'd love to have you sign in officially. Uh, we are going to close the public hearing at this point. Again, this is on the Ellis Road Phase 3 case. And we'll open it up for questions and comments from the commissioners. We will start with Commissioner Johnson and then Commissioner Bryan. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just to get the, uh, the ball rolling, for uh, Patrick, uh, I'm just curious uh, and look at the site map, uh, if uh, the site plan, the plan here. Um, if you were to build a maximum of 350 units, um, what would the parking situation look like for the site? Would it be surface parking or structured? Surface park, sir. And surface how... park limited to the 70% impervious surface. Even though this site is not within a watershed basin, we voluntarily limited the impervious surface to 70% as though it were. Uh, but it's a, it's a surface parked and quick... neighborhood. Thank you. And quick follow-up, is do you have an idea of where the 350 units would go on this site? I'm just curious how you sure. would program it. Sure. It would be uh, um, along the freeway. That pod along the freeway will be uh, townhouses, and then away from the freeway uh, going towards the east will be single-family detached. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, some questions. Uh, page one of the report. The last sentence so it talks about a voluntary annexation petition. Uh, 
Does that cover just the rezoning part? Yes, so yes sir. Any, just the 99 acres that's being rezoned. It's almost exactly 100 acres, but thank you for the clarification. Okay, and uh, the present development plan is showing a number of connections, which has been alluded to, to Glover Road. Right. Uh, will there be that many connections? Now, if you look at it closely, Commissioner Bryan, you'll see there, there, there are merely stub outs uh, to Esther and Kraft, and they're not actually connections. They're actually, mm -hmm. we left property that is controlled by the development group out of the rezoning, so we would not never be able to connect to uh, so this, this development plan will not connect to Esther and Crafton. Uh, we're working with NCDOT to uh, align the access uh, to the north so that it will connect to Wren Road and then go over the railroad tracks. Uh, if that um, plan is implemented, which we believe it will be, uh, then there would not be any connections to Glover Road from this development. Uh, well, if, if that does work out, right. Uh, does it force you to come back here at all with changes to the development plan? No, sir, because that would be a condemnation action by DOT. Okay. And uh, my final question, is: can you address the issue of smell that the gentleman referred to? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, we're locating the nearest house is going to be uh, over 200 feet away from the transfer station. I can't speak for the gentleman's experience, obviously, but... Um, we believe that the, there's about 200 feet of woods between stream buffer and the project boundary buffer. In addition to that, it would be um, uh, additional setbacks on the waste industry side. And so uh, the nearest houses would still be um, 240, 250 feet away. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a recycling facility. It's not a garbage facility. Yeah. So we're, we're confident that we'll be able to build uh, quality housing here for the price points that I described. Thank you. Yes, sir. Commissioner Durkin. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions, Patrick. So yes. One of the special conditions was constructing an exclusive northbound right turn lane to the northbound 147. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. On the special conditions for the 147 northbound ramp. You want to take that? Let me refer that to our traffic sure. engineer. Thanks. Hi, good evening. Ronald Stevenson with Ramey Kemp and Associates, 5808 Farrington Place in Raleigh. So one of the, the special condition related to the northbound ramp for 147, it, it says that you're going to construct an additional exclusive northbound ramp, but then where on the development plan is that connection? Because my understanding was there was not an, a connection to 147. Oh, there, there's not. That's, that's simply making a, a lane improvement on the existing ramp coming off of 147 today. There's one right turn lane coming off. But it's unreal. It's not connected to the site. It's just like correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And then also on the, this Patrick might be for you, but for the, the future land use map yes. change, right. why does that include the existing houses that are not part of this development? That was the staff recommendation for it to be all the way up to Glover Road. I can give you a little bit of anecdotal history on that. When I first graduated from city planning school and I was working in economic development for the Durham Chamber of Commerce, I, I tried to market this area around Glover Road for industrial development for Durham County. And we never got any meaningful prospects to, to even look at it because of the access issues one of these gentlemen referred to. Uh, so when we were looking at this and we looked at the homes on Esther and Crafton, uh, we thought it made sense for the future land use map to go all the way up to Glover in terms of designation as resident, low density residential and then have the area north of Glover up to the East End Connector be industrial. Thank you. I just have one question for staff also. Um, on the, in the staff report, there's reference to the waste industry site a few times, um, suggesting that there was concern about the proximity, but then no recommendations of, to mitigate that. So just wondering if there was anything staff was looking for. Uh, Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. Staff just wanted to make um, it clear in the staff report of the existing site conditions and the surroundings. Okay. Um, we recognize that it is an industrial use to the south. Um, there is a uh, landscape buffer and project boundary buffer uh, between on this subject site for this application. 
Um, there is landscaping on the waste management site, um, but we also recognize that whatever standards are within the UDO in terms of noise, odor, controls, mm -hmm. uh, both applicants, um, both properties would be subject to that, specifically the industrial use. Okay, thank you. Great, okay. thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Miller? So I, uh, I did have a, a question for you, Patrick. Yes, sir. So I'm going to ask you a question with the understanding that the answer you give is not a proper commitment. Um, right now, the development plan says 350 residential units, but it doesn't show a, a unit mix. Can you give right. me an idea of the unit mix? Boy, um, is it about 150 towns? No, you don't know? Ballpark would be up to 200 townhouses and approximately 150 single families. But but you reserve the right to change that a, a, as your plans develop, right? Right. right. But the design commitments that you've enlisted the, that you've listed in the development plan will apply without regard to housing type. That's correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so going back, if, if as I read the um, the staff report and also I talked to at least one neighbor. Uh, out there, it's my understanding that you specifically left property that you own that's out of the project uh, at the end of Crafton and at the end yes. of Esther, yes, sir. so as to not trigger the UDO requirement that you connect to those stubs, and that was at the request of the neighbors, yes. based upon the, the meetings that you had with them. How many meetings did you have with neighbors? Uh, all together three or four, but there were different subsets of neighbors in attendance at those meetings. So I, we had one large meeting that was probably attended by 20, 25, and then smaller subsets after that. All right, thank you. And it, but your characterization of how those went, the, 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 those, that those ended agreeably? It was certainly not <laughs> compared to other projects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that'll go unnamed. Mm -hmm. um, um, Compared to other projects, I would say they were neutral to positive, yes. And so I also want to ask a little bit, because it's not clear to me from the way the development plan shows on our very small scale, what kind of uh, protection are you uh, going to have along the freeway to protect your future residents on the project from uh, mm. uh, freeway impacts, noise, and, and yeah, sight? Anything particular? I'd have to refer to Stephen if you drill down on that specifically. So Stephen Dorn, 605 Fawcett Mill Road, um, landscape architect with McAdams. Um, there is not a, um, a perimeter buffer per se required off of 147. However, we are working uh, currently with NCDOT as well or, um, with a sewer alignment that's going to go there. And then depending on how that, um, how that operates, then that will dictate how far away we are, but um, certainly our desire is to have a 30 or so foot at a minimum um, uh, buffer that we can berm, um, and then the unit itself would be more uh, 50 to 70 uh, plus feet away from the right of way, and then the right of way itself is about uh, 80 feet to the actual highway. So ultimately, we're looking at somewhere around that 200 foot, um, but we're also looking at some some berming as well, just from uh, uh, the end users' uh, the, the goal. And when, when you say berm, are you referring to a, a hump of some height? Yes, sir. Yeah, landscape base, berming. Base for height, and would that be supplemented with plantings? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. It, did you, when you put your uh, development plan together, did you consider making a, a commitment to that effect? Um, we did not necessarily look at making a commitment. Um, being it's driven from 147, we kind of looked at that as um, more so the client's best interest, and they would probably want to do that um, by default. So you're kind of leaving it to market forces? That's, yes, sir, yeah. Plus the sewer. Yeah, and that sewer, it, it, how that shakes out, um, working with DOT to, are we in the right of way, are we out of the right of way? And there's, there's a knoll there that's created by the 147 um, construction, and we're working into trying to uh, mitigate some of their maintenance as well. And so it's a, a bigger conversation uh, certainly around 147 and our property. 
So in, and I want to go back to finally to access to make sure that I understand. Your development plans show a number of access points. Some of those access points are have a two on them. Uh, you have a note two that says uh, that you really don't want to pursue those. But you continue to show them just in case circumstances after rezoning arise that might, might change circumstances and you might have to make a connection where you currently don't plan to. Is that right? The um, so uh, yeah, at time of at time of zoning, they won't let a. Um, I guess I, not speaking for staff, but um, uh, the stubs are required one per fourteen hundred feet in every cardinal direction. I'm sure you guys are aware. Um, at the at the time of development plan, you show per one per fourteen hundred feet, and that gets reviewed at time of site plan um, per ordinance standards. And so we add that note in there to allow that flexibility without having to come back in and rezone the property if. Uh, Right. If an so you have the, the flexibility to, to act on those stubs, but by leaving the separation between the project boundary and the neighboring property, you're not compelled to connect no. by the yes, sir. ordinance. Yes, sir. So we have, there's an implementation in place that we would not connect to those uh, individuals' roads and send traffic through their neighborhoods. So if everything goes right now like you want it to, access to this tract will be uh, up from the from the road that right now is incomplete, mm -hmm. but following the connection or the completion of the DOT project to separate the grade at Glover, you will actually have a road that comes in on, on the project side of the railroad tracks that will exploit that Glover bridge. Correct. Yes, sir. Uh, but it won't be down the way on Glover. It'll be right there, Correct. right there at the railroad tracks. And then another access point will be internal to your phase two uh, which uh, is shown on the, the map, although that's a very steep slope, and I talked with Patrick a little bit about that, but you, you're prepared for that engineering project. Mm -hmm. yep. And then there's a potential another connection also between the phases of your project. Up, uh, I forget the name of the, the street that you've created with a stub. starts with a W. Ran. Where you're building right now. Is that Ren Road? Uh, I think it is. They're realigning Ren Road. There might be a connection to Ren Road with MCDOT um, internal to the property. All right. Yes, sir, that's correct. So, but if everything goes right, that's the way you see access working for this project in the future. That's 100% correct, yeah. Uh, and those other things are there only as uh, More so as, they might, as they might be, be needed if, if your plans go differently than you expect. Absolutely, yeah. It's set up for future. If, if the future development to the north was to come in and Yes, want to sir. redevelop, then there's opportunity. So um, uh, it's set up our development for the larger picture. If at one point um, all of that was to redevelop, then the city could look into making some sort of connection. But that would be a bigger conversation. Thank you. And, and just to comment, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, may uh, I like the idea <laughs> that you have looked at the impact on the future land use map and the comprehensive plan outside the borders of your property. Uh, and rounding the corners, as it were, by including the the, re the existing residential south of Glover. Uh, if we change the future land use map as a result of this case and left that designated industrial when it's clearly developing uh, residential, uh, that would actually leave a, 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 a something on the map that would make me uncomfortable by, by essentially seeing that that's a problem and addressing it now r rather than just waiting for that to maybe happen or maybe not happen uh, is the way to go. I wish we saw that more frequently in these cases. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, I recognize Ms. Sunyak. If um, Jamie Sunyak, Planning Department. First off, uh, staff has had the opportunity to review the design commitment proffers, and um, they are acceptable. Uh, the second um, item I wanted to bring up is there is nothing on the existing development plan that discusses these changes to um, the roadway connections through the railroad properties and eliminating the connection to Glover Road. So if that does occur, then the applicant would um, have to uh, come back to the Planning Commission um, or change their um, uh, zoning at that time. It would be a a, a different zoning application. But you're referring, if I may? You may. You're referring to the connection that's shown at Glover that is a short distance from the railroad track? 
Right. Because right now three are shown. Mm -hmm. One on Esther, one on Crafton, and then that other one, which doesn't actually have a roadway in there, but evidently there's right of way on the map. Uh, that one is required. Correct. I think the applicant, if he can correct me if I'm wrong, but the applicant was alluding to uh, eliminating that. And under the current development plan, that would not be. I probably caused that. I was actually only referring to Esther and Crafton. The ones that are that are on the development plan are marked with a note to. Right. Right. Uh, right. That 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 other one, that little short one that's up close to the railroad track, that's not marked with a note to. Correct. And that, that actually would be required. Correct. Right. My my experience is that if NCDOT moves forward with a condemnation action against a, a development, that a development plan is not required to have a rezoning because NCDOT changed the access point. And before, uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle, before we get to you, I just want to give the staff a chance to finish any of their clarifying comments. Yep. Uh, Staff saying that at that time we would have to evaluate the situation. We're not going to be able to just answer it on the spot. Thank you. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes, sir. For your transportation, just a question. The upgrades that you're stating for Glover and Anger, can you give me a little details on that? Well, there's a um, one of the things we looked at through this was the possibility of putting in a traffic signal at that location. It and definitely needs one. Yeah, so that's 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 something that is a is, is a requirement. So we're going to be you know working through that, um, you know, as as it's allowed and approved by the DOT. Okay. Another concern I had. I've been out of the loop for a while. I've been retired eight years, but I was a deputy sheriff. Mm -hmm. We that was a constant headache and problem with us with the railroad through there, uh, as far as from all the way from uh, Ellis and Anger all the way back past Wren Road of blocking, you know, the area and access in there. Has this been addressed or spoken, you know, it, uh, uh, or, or, you know, a, a it's a concern of mine because I, I recall the problem, you know, years back that we had with this. Well, one of the things, I mean, obviously the, the grade separation project is, is coming. And uh, so, um, you know, I'll also like to point out that the traffic, that was going out that way is not, we're, we're not increasing that significantly, you know, with this with this project. So um, the DOT's position has been the grade separation is the the way that all that gets addressed. And so, and that's coming, so. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I just realized you got you got a good development and I fully support it, but if the uh, access is coming off of Wren Road, I knew how we used to get, like I said, constantly had complaints of how the trains would block Wren Road and, and, and all, all in that entire stretch through there. That's why I just, you know, wondered if, if that had been addressed. Yeah. Uh, Pat, uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle, Patrick Biker for the project. Uh, we were very impressed with the plan NCDOT came forward with to grade separate the railroad tracks and Glover and then to rework the road access. So your, your point is well taken and all of us have seen exactly what you're talking about and nobody on our team wants to make it any worse. So we're, we're working as we're working hard as we with can them on with NCDFT okay. to make this, uh, make this great separation and the related road improvements happen as quickly as possible. That my answers my question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Baker. So um, thank you, Jamie. I uh, really always seem to know these cases inside and out. It's really appreciated. And I also really appreciate that you brought, you know, uh, multiple staff members. These are big projects and there is a lot to deal with. Um, I think this is uh, looking good. I do have a few questions for the applicant. Um, my first question is, uh, where is and how much um, parkland or open space is there? Uh, that would be in the north west quadrant will be a um, significant amount of uh, open recreational space and Stephen can probably give you a better number than I can for yeah. that. Yeah, so based on the density, um, once this moves to a, a site plan, um, based on the PDR a density of less than, or I guess we are, the, if we're three acres or not, if we're higher or below three units an acre, um, we'll either have 15 or 16 percent uh, required for open space. Um, of that, a third of that would be recreational open space. So you're looking around five acres of recreational open space, 
minimum uh, recre recre uh, open space in general, and then 20% tree save. Um, very likely, uh, we will be uh, well over um, that 15% open space. I would imagine more than that the 25-30% open space, if actually not more. Um, we're looking. There's some area that is not actually sewerable on the sewer sewerable on the property. Mm -hmm. um, kind of that northwest corner um, that's in a separate basin, and so that'll actually be remain as a as a uh, micro park, if you will, very passive um, kind of recreational facilities. Um, so that's kind of the intention at the moment. So I imagine um, uh, there will be a lot of open space, uh, and then by default, some rec open space as well. Okay, but there's but there's no commitment to that, except for the the minimum that you're talking about. That's correct. The UDO then will by default have a commitment at time of site plan. Yes, sir. Yeah, there is. Um, are there going to be any green building elements, uh, low impact development, um, you know, sustainability? Anything like that? Yeah, sure. Uh, not in particular, no, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, so in our last meeting, we had a, a, a large discussion um, about missing middle housing and uh, housing, housing choice in Durham, um, talking about how there's a need for more duplexes and triplexes and quadruplexes and, and um, so on. Um, I'm curious about how many of those types of units you might expect to see in this development. No, I'd go back to, uh, I believe it was Commissioner Miller's question. Our, our anticipated build out is approximately 200 townhomes and approximately 150 single family detached homes. Okay, so 350 single family yeah. passion detached. What? Correct. Is the only, okay. Correct. <clears throat> um, what elements of walkability are going to be included in this? Um, <clears throat> so, and when I say that, I, um, I'm thinking of, you know, alleys or, are, you know, do you, do you have any information about average block length or connectivity or anything like that? Um, so, there is a max block perimeter, a max block perimeter uh, within the suburban tier. Um, I'd have to refer to plan with it. That one. So just so just what's in the UDO. Yeah, and so I. I, we're obviously going to meet the UDO, um, but from the speaking from pedestrian circulation, um, as far as walkability, um, Durham section has a sidewalk on one side of the roads. We'll um, very likely have it on both sides, um, as that's a, just a, a nicer um, experience for the end development. Um, there will also be um, connectivity to kind of um, to many park, pocket parks within the development. Um, so all that is still kind of a, a moving target, but. Um, certainly, that's the goal of the development. Um, the uh, block perimeter standards, um, especially within the townhome, obviously we're going to hit uh, easily hit the block perimeter, and then um, there's going to be the the site itself kind of narrows, and so there's only so much you can do as it as it goes off to the the east, if you will. So, um, but I think Jamie might be able to answer on some of that block perimeter standard. Okay. Uh, Jamie Sunday, Planning Department. I I can't really comment on that. I just wanted to make it clear that those those types of discussions are not part of the development plan. There's no commitments relative to what um, you're alluding to. So that might that's um, will be determined at the time of site plan. Right. There's no requirements for that. <clears throat> if they wanted to make a commitment, though, they they could make a commitment. That would be up to the applicant. Right. That's mm -hmm. we can't force them to do that because it's not in the UDO. Um, okay, so again, thank you. Um, you know, you used a lot of really great language in your introduction, you know, talking about missing middle housing and, um, you know, affordability to the workforce, and those are really, really important things. Um, you know, I think that there's a slow momentum shift in the types of developments that we're uh, allowing, that we're requiring in, in the city of Durham, and, you know, that's slowly changing over time. Um, it's, a, it's a slow culture shift. Um, this is, you know, I think uh, a good development. Um, I would like to see more um, it to, in order to make me feel comfortable. So I'm actually not going to be supporting this, and I would actually encourage um, other commissioners to um, follow suit. So, um, but you're almost there. It's looking good, and um, you know, I just want to encourage the types of things that we just talked about. 
um, you know, in, in maybe future, future proposals. And again, I, I think you're doing really great work and um, I appreciate ha having uh, all of you here today. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, we can we can talk about these things a little bit more in the future. So thanks. Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, I want to start off with asking uh, my neighbor here, uh, Commissioner Baker. Uh, and are you referring specifically to walkability uh, trails uh, in the walkability? Uh, and I'm just. I think I'm supposed to address uh, the chairman. <laughs> so uh, I guess I just ask the chairman if he would ask uh, to uh, clarify that for me. Right, uh, Commissioner Baker, you may you may respond to the question. I'm sorry. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has. What were you specifically referring to uh, as walkability? Sure. So I, I would be comfortable with, a, with more of a commitment to sustainable uh, design, to green building uh, features, to sidewalk, sidewalks and street trees on both sides of the street, to short blocks. Um, if there were alleys, that would, that would be encouraged. Um, I think uh, also if um, there were more variety of housing types. Um, you know, this is 350 single family units. I mean, you know, I think we want to encourage more, um, more variety than that. Um, so those, those are the main things that, that I'm thinking about right now. Um, and, you know, hopefully that this is a discussion that we can continue having and, and uh, you know, developers will start coming forward and making these types of commitments to us uh, more in the future. Right. Commissioner Thank Gibbs, the Commissioner floor is yours. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that, uh, did I not read in here that there will be sidewalks provided along uh, the roads within this development? Or am I, do I have it mixed up with the other one? There, there will be sidewalks along the city of Durham uh, street section has requ requirement of sidewalk on one side at a minimum um, of their street section. So um, that will be there. I'm not sure if it specifically says in the report, but that will be an item that will be addressed at time of site plan. Yeah, walkability is something that I, I like in neighborhoods also. Uh, uh, you know, people can walk anywhere they want to ever ever how far or how short their trip may be but I do think uh, sidewalks seem to be the the main mode of pedestrian travel uh, you know to maintain connection with your neighbors and all of that uh, but anyway that said my interest was peaked a while ago when you mentioned uh, DOT or the railroad uh, separation. I don't know if, if you or somebody from staff may need to answer that. If you know the answer, how are they going to separate it? Is it going to be uh, Ellis, Ro uh, Road. Ellis Road up or down? Glover will go over, right? Yeah, Glover will go over the railroad tracks. Okay, so there won't be any real hold up there. Uh, and I guess you can still make a left-hand turn on to, from Glover, is it Glover now rather than Ellis? Glover is the northern. It's limit. further north. Yeah, north. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's the same kind of situation, but you can still turn left before you go over the bridge of the railroad tracks. Yes. Yeah. I, that, that was just some information I wanted to find out. And I got a late, and I guess we all got this, uh, a late uh, email about some concerns of two neighbors. Uh, and it had to do mainly with stormwater uh, Maintaining the, 
I guess you could call it the riparian barriers along the the streams that are existing here. And I'm, if everything follows suit as usual, uh, code has a requirement there, but I, I don't know why they, I don't know if they were asking for something in addition to, uh, but I'm sure staff has reviewed everything and I am always satisfied with what staff uh, comes up with. Uh, but I'd, I would like to support this, uh, this project. Um, so that's all for me, sir. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Vice Chair Hyman? Yes, um, thank you. I recognize that, you know, many times the devil is in the details, but um, I'm particularly in support of this project because um, as a former uh, occupant of the Research Triangle Park, and having watched it develop over the years, one of the things that had not happened during that period of time was housing or middle housing, affordable housing for those individuals who actually uh, worked uh, within that area. So um, I don't want that point to be missed because um, we still have 20 individuals moving to Durham every single solitary day. And it is going to be important for us to be able to have housing for them in order to support our overall area. So I wanted to make those comments so that that particular point is not lost and I will be supporting this project. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question for staff. Um, both in the staff report and the uh, justification statements by the applicant, uh, this 2013 study has been referenced, the, the Durham Industrial Land Study, um, which I guess evaluates some criteria to, or evaluates the market, marketability of land for industrial uses. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, because um, we've gotten a few cases, at least since I've been here, where we've changed the zoning from industrial to residential based on some of the criteria that um, from the study, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if we are at risk of not having, just because it's not marketable, marketable doesn't mean we don't need the land for industrial use uh, long term. So I, I'm, I'm curious if there's any concern from staff about the amount of industrial land that we need going forward. And I guess a follow-up question to that is, is there going to be a, another study similar to this done soon so some of this can be updated? Yeah, my understanding, and they're shaking their heads, yes, um, is that the industrial land use study is is in the process um, of being updated. Okay. Um, so um, I understand your, your concerns relative to the, the loss of industrial zoning, um, but in this particular area, on this particular site, we did look at whether or not this property is suitable for industrial development, and based on um, the amount of land that could be developed. Um, the site has a lot of environmental constraints, riparian areas, um, wetlands, um, it, it, uh, steep slopes. And, and so um, those criteria were evaluated and also the site does not have um, correct uh, connection to the highway as well. So that was also a consideration. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Great. Commissioner Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also kind of wanted to say I have said this from time to time as we have looked at uh, requests for rezonings between uh, the Durham's urban, more urban core and the airport. Uh, we seem to be, in my opinion, just kind of crazy quilting uh, the way we're developing in there by considering these cases one rezoning at a time. Uh, I wish we could get in there and really make sense out of what we see the real future land use pattern and really look at it parcel by parcel. Uh, I'm going to support this rezoning simply for the reasons that Jamie said. I went to Esther Drive and looked down into the, the, the great dis difference down there. It's got to be 40, 50 feet. By the time you get down to the bottom in there, uh, fortunately in the winter you can see all the way down. Uh, 
I don't see how you could have effective industrial uh, actual development in there. So when we do our comprehensive planning exercise over the next couple of years, uh, rather than just looking at maps and t the two-dimensional uh, world of it on white paper, we need to really look at what's on the ground and, and designate and preserve for future development those sites that are best suited for industrial development and then protect them and then make also orderly places for uh, future residential development, uh, keeping in mind that, as Commissioner Hyman said, uh, we have made decisions uh, to make big changes for the Research Triangle Park in Durham County. I read in the newspaper even this morning uh, that, the, that the essentially urban center that they want to make uh, where the old Governor's Inn used to be, we have essentially blown the lid off zoning for that site and uh, it will include residential and, and commercial and all those things that make up a city and town. And we are going to have to look at that as a point of gravitation. Uh, and so while you, we may consider this site as being way away from the urban center of Durham, it's actually fairly close to the new urban center of the Research Triangle Park. And I think when we do planning in this area, along the freeway corridor and along the I-40, corridor between here and the airport, I think we're going to have to keep in mind that uh, there are going to be kind of two urban middles, uh, and Durham is not going to be a, uh, it's going to cease to be a one city town, uh, one city county in the future. I'm not seeing any, uh, Commissioner Williams, Then and then I think we'll move to a motion. I just have a general um, concern with the impact of traffic as it relates to Glover and um, as heavily traveled as Glover Road is now and coming off of Ellis, especially given the 8 o'clock a.m. era and the 4 to 6 p.m. travel off of Miami onto Angier by way of Ellis Road to get to 147, and a dedicated lane will certainly help with that. But um, I do understand if I am correct that there will be another commitment or a change to the application if there's a change to what is already submitted as far as um, your development plan is concerned. I understand the need to not necessarily have Glover as an access point. I, I definitely understand that in the consideration. So I just want to speak on behalf of addressing the question that was proposed earlier in terms of using Glover as an access point and the impacts of that. I know once you come off of um, Ellis Road and travel down Glover trying to get there, I don't know if they're going to paint those rocks or make them glow or something, but somebody is going to have a rough time trying to navigate that, especially in the rain and water tends to sit there. So I just, I think what you're building is awesome. I do still have a concern about that access point as far as Glover is concerned. And I see that you guys have the same concerns and the same consideration. I do want to, did want to let the gentleman know that it was officially questioned and it appears that your concern is valid and has been taken note as far as the transportation issues as far as Glover Road access point is concerned. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. I think this is an appropriate time for a motion. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case A1700018 forward to City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bryan and seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle. And this is the uh, the first case out of two, so we will have a roll call vote, please. Hi, this is for the, the plan amendment on case A1700018. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kenchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. And motion passes 12-1. Thank you. And an additional motion on the zoning case, please. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case Z1700052 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation, and that includes the additional committed element I thought was added tonight. Second. <clears throat> Moved and seconded. We'll have a roll call vote. 
Yes. Um, Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kenshin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Um, motion passes 12 to 1. Great. Thank you all very much. A reminder, this will now move forward to the City Council for their, uh, their review, and they have the final decision on this matter. We are moving to our second case this evening. This is also a future land use map amendment with concurrent zoning map change. Thank you. This is case A18 quadruple zero two and Z18 quadruple zero five, 3920 South Austin Avenue. And we'll start with the staff report. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z180005, which is uh, uh, 3920 South Austin Avenue. The applicant is Dan Jewell from Coulter Jewell Thames. The site is located at uh, 3920 South Austin Avenue and is 1.863 acres in size. The rezoning request is office and institutional to in, uh, industrial light with a development plan. The applicant is also proposing a future land use map amendment from office to institutional. Um, the applicant seeks a rezoning to allow a building of uh, 12,000 square feet for all uses permitted in the industrial light zoning district. This is the aerial map. The subject site is shown in red. Um, the property is located within the suburban tier and also located within the Cape Fear River Basin. These uh, pictures depict the site and the area. Um, the property contains... Time's up. <laughs> it's subtle, but you can ignore it. <laughs> like the bee. The property uh, contains a um, 7,200 square foot building. It's one story. There's associated parking with a dumpster area. The rear portion of the property is undeveloped, and then it slopes down towards the adjacent railroad tracks abutting NC-55. There are a large number of hardwood trees scattered throughout the site. Um, the area, uh, South Austin Avenue corridor, contains a number of light industrial uses including the Tri Center um, South complex to the east, several mini warehouses, uh, self-storage facilities, commercial, commercial salvage yards um, with intermittent um, residences and vacant lots. This is the zoning context map. The applicant has submitted an application to change the zoning from OI, which is shown on the left, to industrial light on the right in purple. And this is the associated future land use map. Um, on the left, you can see the property is in uh, pink, which is the office designation, and in purple on the right, which is the industrial designation. Proposed conditions, there is a, a maximum pervious um, coverage of 90%, a tree protection requirement of 10%, um, and the uh, development plan shows the required street yard, side yard, and rear yard, as well as access points and the areas where um, they are, uh, there's existing project boundary buffer um, encroachments. Um, text commitments, I, um, I already, allude, already alluded to. already alluded to the building size. Um, they have set a maximum building height at 50 feet. Uh, there has, there's a text commitment providing additional asphalt for a, a future bicycle lane along South Austin Avenue. Um, the plan also shows, um, again, the site access points, parking and building envelopes, the buffer encroachment areas, and the tree coverage areas, and there are some uh, design commitments relative to the building materials and their roof types. In terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan and policies, the proposed um, industrial light zoning designation does not comply with the current office designation. Um, however, 
It does, it is consistent with 212C. Um, the proposed industrial future land use designation is consistent with the intent of the suburban tier. Uh, it provides an opportunity for additional industrial land and employment. Um, the site will be subject to the industrial light zoning district standards, as well as the applicable requirements in the UDO, uh, including those addressing um, lighting, noise, and other site impacts. With respect to 213I, the parcel is already improved with an existing building and parking lot. The proposed use, while it's not committed to, is intended for manufacturing and distribution of laboratory testing equipment. The location is consistent with 242C as the site has direct access to a minor thoroughfare. Uh, the change, um, proposed change, would make the site more compatible with the industrial uses to the northeast, uh, to the north and to the east, and the increasing number of industrial users in the area. Uh, there is existing infrastructure in place to support the proposal. In terms of 234C, the uh, Unified Development Ordinance requires project boundary buffers um, between industrial and residential zoning um, and the land use the land use is to allow for appropriate uh, transitions as shown in the development plan. And with respect to 814D, the development plan commits to additional asphalt along um, South Austin Avenue frontage for the site of the site for a future bicycle lane. Staff determines that, this re that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. We will open the public hearing. We have one individual signed up to speak for us, Mr. Dan Jewell. Thank you, Jamie. Good evening, Commissioners. Dan Jewell, Coulter Jewell, Thames. Uh, I'll be pretty brief. I'm here at the request of Mr. Uh, Peter Piercini, he's here in, here in the audience today. He is the uh, CEO and uh, president of Zen Bio. They are a, uh, a company that actually assembles kits or different laboratory procedures, uh, much as if you went to the doctor's office and you need a, a suture, the doctor would grab a kit, rip it open, there'd already be the sutures and all that kind of stuff. Because he does the same thing for laboratory stuff. And as you can imagine, there's a, a good need for that uh, here because there is a lot of laboratory research that goes on in this area. You can ask my wife, she does that. This was the, um, I, would, I don't want to call it old because it wasn't. This was an, an Elks Lodge that just opened about 10 years ago. Uh, I, I actually did the lighting survey for them to get their certificate of occupancy about 10 years ago. Sadly, as many of us know, though, uh, social and fraternity organizations are sort of declining in this, in this country. So they gave it a go, but uh, they finally had to shut their doors a, a while ago. <laughs> if anybody's interested in pursuing that, there was a great book called Bowling Alone that came out about 15 years ago that, that uh, talks about all that stuff. So the, the zoning request is, um, is for, to, to put a zoning in place that will allow him to occupy the existing building. It's an existing metal building on the site uh, so that he could create these lab kits, as Jamie said, it would be considered a lighted, light industrial manufacturing type, type use. Uh, there is a strong existing uh, uh, industrial character in the neighborhood. Not sure why there's a lot of O and I zoning backing up to the tracks because I was not able to identify any uses that I would actually consider office type uses. I think it's just been out there for a long, long time and it's left over. There's two uh, residences immediately south of here. We held a neighborhood meeting uh, last March. Uh, those properties are owned by the Ship and Madron families. They came to the neighborhood meeting. We had a really good chat. Um, they wished us well. Uh, they know that someday uh, their properties will be desirable and somebody will probably want to turn them into something else. But for the time being, they just like being out there and, and they just like the neighborhood the way it is. They were really, really great folks. Uh, we have proposed uh, as a commitment a modest increase to the existing floor area on the site. I think there's about 7,200 square feet. We are actually committing to a maximum of 12,000 square feet. Those of you who are familiar with uh, this zoning know that by right you could do up to 60% of the site in uh, floor area, which would translate to something between 45 and 50,000 square feet. So just to show you that the intent is not to 
knock that building down and build something huge, um, he's committing to only a maximum of 12,000 square feet, which would give him room to do a modest addition on the building at some point in the future. Um, they, um, when, when they ramp up the location, they anticipate having uh, uh, 25 employees, which is actually a 50% increase over what they can accommodate at their existing location. So, uh, you know, good, good job location. Um, the tax commitments, as you see, we are uh, committed to widening Alston Avenue to allow a future bike lane when enough, enough of it is patched together. Um, we are uh, uh, committing to beefing up the existing substandard landscape buffers where there is some existing pavement encroachment up against the property line. And, uh, and of course, any new development that takes place in the future would have to uh, meet the new buffer requirements and, and, and take that. Uh, take that out. One of the other committed elements is um, uh, is probably going to be a pricey one, but uh, believe it or not, even though there's an existing big water line out front, fire hydrants, the building has sprinklers, um, the city water system cannot provide enough water to meet the National Fire Protection Act requirements. So he, unless somebody else beats him to it, which is not likely, uh, is going to have to run a larger water line down there to serve an existing building with an existing fire hydrant and an existing fire sprinkler in the building. So uh, that's where we are. Um, <laughs> as Jamie said, staff is finding consistency. Um, we would request that you all uh, consider making a recommendation for approval to the council, and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. And as we did before, if there's anyone else who did not get a chance to speak up for this public hearing, please raise your hand and we'll bring you up. I don't see anyone, so we will close the public hearing. Commissioners, we'll start on my left. Any questions or comments? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, to, I'm sorry, Dan. I'm just curious as I read the the application and then I looked at the commitments. So is the plan, a couple questions. One, is the plan for there to be multiple, potentially multiple buildings on the site or just the one existing building? Well, well, um, his plan is one building, potentially a building addition. Uh, obviously, our commitment is to a maximum square footage. So it is, it is possible that uh, he or somebody else could build another standalone building on the site. Uh, but, um, you know, again, we're, 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 we're committing to a maximum square footage, right. which is pretty modest. Right. And so I was just asking, because as I read, it says a maximum building, singular size, singular term, uh, up to 12,000 square feet. But then when I looked at the commitments, it said, if in some places it says building, but then if any new buildings or additions are built, da, da, da. so I was just curious as if there was... And I assure you that's just my uh, very poor uh, check of grammar for, for plurals on the end of that. So <laughs> we are not committing to only one building if that's the, if that's the gotcha. okay. That, yeah. that's, if that's okay. That's the answer to it. Yeah. And then the only other one is, is the plan to, is it uh, more conceptualized as a retrofitting of the, a rehabbing of the existing building or could it be a, a tear down, completely rebuild? What's the, uh, again, his, his intent is to move into the existing building with some retrofitting. It's, as you can imagine, it's just a, big space in there with a kitchen. It was an Elk Lodge, Elks Lodge, so he would add some rooms in there. We are we are not committing to not tearing down the building, uh, but again, with the with the restriction we have put on maximum square footage, I can assure you that it's it would be a uh, it would be tough economically to justify tearing the existing building down and bu building a new one out there. But I'm I'm not saying we're committing. It's just a it's a pre-engineered metal building with a Fake brick veneer on the front. That's what it, what it is. That's what it looks like, too. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Commissioner Bryan. I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, I drive on South Austin a lot. It used to be one of the ways I would go home from my job in RTP. I know that traffic can sometimes be a problem, but I've been on it at rush hour, and I was still able to get home in one piece. Uh, I support this because I'm pleased to see that we're taking this piece of property and putting it back into use. So, thank you. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also support this, but I will say my one reservation is that it's not have anything to do with the use of the property for light industrial or uh, 
for the uh, project as it's been described by the developer's representative. It has to do with the future land use map and the comprehensive plan. I don't like having a sawtooth office, industrial office pattern on that side of uh, South Austin Avenue. Uh, we saw in the last case where the developer included land outside the project in order to round the corners in a sensible way uh, to make the future land use map for his property and for his neighboring property make sense in the future. Uh, and this is another place where I would love, love it if that parcel, similar size parcel immediately to the north were also uh, redesignated uh, light industrial to join it with the, the larger tracks above to make a more homogenous and, and sensibly shaped uh, uh, district for light industrial in the area. But again, knowing that we are about to do comprehensive planning, uh, knowing that the office use that's on that site would be allowed in light industrial so there wouldn't be an inconsistency, uh, I'm going to support this knowing that this is something I hope will be fixed uh, in the next year or so when we do comprehensive, comprehensive plan review. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Miller. I don't see any other questions or comments, so I'm open to a motion. Commissioner Bryan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we send case A180002 forward to City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Johnson. We'll have a roll call vote, please. Um, Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Darkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kanchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. And uh, passes 13 0. Thank you. In the zoning case, Commissioner Bryan, you're carrying a heavy load tonight. Thank you. I move that we send case Z180005 forward to City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle. Staff, may we have a voice vote on this, or do you prefer the roll call? We can do a voice. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. So we have two more cases this evening. These are both just zoning map changes. And the first case is case Z180014. This is the Davis Park West proposal. And we'll start with the staff report again. Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will now be presenting case Z18-00014, Davis Park West. The applicant is Craig Davis. This 10.847 acre site is located at 362 Davis Drive and 900 Marion Avenue and is comprised of two lots. This site is located within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from commercial ge general with a development plan to mix use with a development plan. The property is designated commercial in the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. The proposal consists of a maximum of 245,000 square feet of offense and 35,000 square feet of commercial and 482 residential units. The site is shown in red, located off of Davis Drive in the Triangle Metro Compact Neighborhood Development Tier. The site is part of the Davis Park West Development, located just outside of RTP. Uh, this aerial map is a little bit outdated. You'll notice that there has been development uh, to the south as well as continued um, development of the apartments to the west. 
The site photos here show that the property has been cleared and graded, includes an existing stormwater pond, and is framed by streets, street trees, and sidewalks. The site is otherwise undeveloped. The area photos here show that this site is adjacent to multifamily residential, townhomes, offices, and commercial uses. The site is presently zoned commercial general with a development plan, CGD. The applicant proposes to change this designation to mixed use with a development plan, MUD. The property is designated commercial on the future land use map, which is consistent with the requested rezoning. Uh, the pro proposed conditions here um, show that the development plan provides site access points, building and parking envelopes, transitional use areas, um, specific specifies the uses, and the maximum building height. Key commitments include that the proposed development will be constructed in phases and vertically integrated. The overall intensity specifies maximums of 245,000 square feet of office, 35,000 square feet of commercial and 482 residential units. Design commitments specify that a minimum of 60% of street frontages shall contain a building and set minimum ground floor glazing standards and landscape design guidelines. A maximum height of 145 feet has been set, uh, except where the transitional use area limits the height. The proposed MUD zoning designation complies with the current commercial designation on the future land use map and applicable policies. It is consistent with, with policy 213E, 231G, and 232A. Staff determines that this request is, is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. And staff is, as always, available for any questions. Thank you. As with the other cases, we'll open a public hearing, and we have two people signed up, and maybe the third that signed up earlier. So Patrick Biker, Ryan Johnson, and Heather Schaefer, if you're still here. And all three are signed up in support. So we'll start with Mr. Biker. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, good evening again, Chairman Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. I still live at 2614 Stewart Drive. <laughs> Along with Craig Davis, the CEO of Craig Davis Properties, our traffic engineer Earl Llewellyn with Kimley Horn, and our lead, archi lead architect Michael Stevenson with Perkins and Will, I'm here tonight representing Craig Davis Properties for this agenda item. It has been my privilege to work with Craig Davis Properties on this development for the past 15 years. Back around 2003 and 2004, we referred to this section of Durham as Triangle Metro Center, and it was approved and began developing in accordance with the Durham 2020 Comprehensive Plan. The 2020 plan was our community's first planning document to call for compact neighborhoods. And Triangle Metro Center was a groundbreaking development, literally and figuratively, 15 years ago. As Triangle Metro Center was moving forward, the original version of our current comprehensive plan was adopted in February of 2005. In that initial version of our comp plan, Triangle Metro Center was specifically designated as a compact neighborhood on the development tier map. Then. Over the past decade or so, in the wake of the Great Recession and with the demise of the Triangle Transit Authority's Regional Fixed Guideway Plan, we renamed this 150-acre area as Davis Park. Pursuant to what we designed and what was approved 15 years ago, Davis Park has been built out so far as a surface parked development. Now, while we think the Finsbury townhomes and those condominiums, along with the other residential neighbor residential units that were developed in accordance with the original entitlements, that all represents a great neighborhood here in Durham. But now we strongly believe that this is the time for Davis Park to become more vertical, to incorporate structured parking, and quite frankly, to provide the shot in the arm that the RTP section of Durham has needed for the past 15 years. In short, Davis Park West can provide the, pedest the pedestrian-oriented mixed-use environment to generate this type of momentum we need in order to create an alternative, vibrant location for businesses and residents outside of downtown. To that end, we are proposing this mixed-use development, which brings the intensity to support structured parking and vertically integrated commercial uses. We have put together a tremendous local team to create this 125 or more million dollar project. 
a mixed-use development that's spearheaded by Craig Davis and Michael Stevenson with Perkins and Will right here in downtown Durham. We respectfully request your recommendation of approval for this ambitious project to transform 10 vacant acres into the game changer this part of Durham needs. We have a few folks from Finsbury who are here tonight, and after they share their thoughts, our team will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. So Ryan Johnson is signed up to speak next. Okay. Please in favor. Okay, I'm trying this again. Uh, Ryan Johnson, uh, 700 Finsbury Street. Um, I'm in favor of the proposal simply because right now it is just, the land is just sitting there. Um, I would like to ask either the developer or uh, whoever what exactly that commercial land will be used for. Uh, I'm not sure of the appropriateness of this, but uh, I would say that you know, right now we have a great community um, and the addition of a sheets right near us was a huge um, convenience improvement in at least my life. And I think given the fact that from eight to nine and from five to six, it is completely full with a line, I think a lot of other people's lives. Um, I would like to say that if we are gonna take that next step and kind of make it into a the type of second center, um, I'd strongly encourage things like a grocery store. That would be a huge, huge commit, or, you know, huge convenience improvement. Um, that being said, the land isn't really being used for anything currently, and uh, therefore I would um, support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second time's the charm. <laughs> and Heather Schaefer. Hi, my name is Heather Schaefer. I live at 120 Finsbury Street in Durham. Um, I have been a part of um, Davis Park since 2005 when I put my deposit in. So um, I have been a part of it since the original vision. And then, of course, I was also part of it in 2008 when the recession happened. So um, I'm speaking for this development because I'm really excited to see at least part of the original vision come to fruition. I'm excited to see that it can increase my property values, as well as we have a very tight community because we are located in RTP. There's not a lot outside of our immediate area, so we are all very excited about having a place where we can walk our dogs and, and gather for you know, a drink or whatever after work. So very supportive of this. Thank you very much. Anyone else who want to speak? Yes, ma'am. You can give us your name and your address and make your remarks. My name is Cheryl Leister, and I also live in Davis Park. I live on Side Park Street. I've lived in the community for about six years. I've been a member of our, we have both POA and HOA for years. I know a lot of people in the community. I speak with people all the time. And it's my opinion that a lot of people in our area really support this type of development. I don't know all of the details. I have some concerns, of course, about traffic, which I'm sure will be addressed. But I do have to say that, you know, the majority of people I know are, like Heather said, are really welcome this sort of development because people want places to walk to. And those are my comments. Thank you. If you don't mind, too, we do you mind just coming up and signing in on the the public hearing sheet, that would be a big help. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to speak? I don't see anyone else. So we're going to close the public hearing. Commissioners, we'll start on my right. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. As always, I have questions. Uh, Patrick, just a couple. Uh, hoping you can help me with, um, conceptualize mm -hmm. the residential piece here. So mm -hmm. on parcel B, uh, it notes that it would only be committed for residential Correct. Uh, units. Yes, sir. Then some residential may or uh, likely will be on the parcel CD, right. C and D. So when I'm seeing uh, a maximum up to um, 482 units. Yes, sir. What would that look like? How how many floors? Uh, there would be a taller building, as as Emily uh, described in her very thorough staff report, um, because we're in the compact neighborhood tier. The buildings have to be close to Davis Drive. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be uh, where the taller building is uh, outside the tra transitional use area. Uh, that building uh, on parcel B 
uh, could be um, six to nine stories tall. Uh, and then on the uh, parcel CD closer to the existing apartments, it would be much lower because we want to transition back to the existing buildings and that building would probably be three or four stories similar to what's already there. And um, quick follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for the, just the commercial space mm -hmm. and whatnot, uh, I think I saw it, it'll be ver vertically integrated yes, and whatnot. So with the thir maximum 35,000 square right. feet be like a single floor? Or two. Yes, sir. Gotcha. Yep, single floor of commercial with office or residential on top of it. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan. Um, Patrick, I um, um, admire the vision of, of making this development or proposing this development with the vertical integration and the structured parking. Uh, the one thing that I don't like about it is that with the structured parking, which I know is expensive, um, imagine it rules out any chance of affordable housing. That's probably true. Yeah. Thank you. That was my question. Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> is the maximum square footage of, in the commercial 35,000 square feet or 15,000 yes, square feet? 35. Okay. So in the staff report, there are a couple of instances where it says 15,000, and I think the traffic generation is based, it says, on 15,000 square foot. Um, fast food restaurant or something like that, or fast casual restaurant. So I, I assume that number would go up just a little bit. Um, and then uh, just to clarify, I, I assume that, and this is in the, on the first page of the development plan, um, the phasing intensity. Yes, mm -hmm. um, so the future phases in that table in text commitment one. Yes, sir. Um, it says up to 420, <laughs> Square 20, sorry, up to 420,000 square feet. That includes the initial 44 to 280, right? And so everything is inclusive of the first phase. Is, phase, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, because that can be read. That's kind of ambiguous, I think. Yes, yeah, it's, it's in the, the joys of working with our mixed use ordinance, but yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I think that's, that's all I had for now. I just, these clarification questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, thank you. And you reserve the right for, for future questions. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Miller. So thank you very much. I, so it is interesting, and I, I should have caught this myself, and I, uh, I'm grateful to Commissioner Al Turk for pointing it out. On page five of the staff report, that uh, 15,000 instead of 45,000 is repeated in section F and in G. Um, doesn't stop my support for the project. Um, I do want to, just did want to point out, this is one of those situations where when, if, and again, I'm looking at the existing zoning, proposed zoning map that we have in our report, where the predominant uses in each of the quadrants of this uh, important intersection, um, while being perfectly correct under the zoning code, are actually uses which don't conform to the names of the zoning categories that so we have office institutional across the street from this project, but it's primarily residential. Uh, this corner is uh, zoned commercial general, but the predominant use is going to be residential. Over in the industrial, in the other quadrant diagonally across the street from the project, that's industrial light, but it's got a shopping center on it. Uh, so it's just one of those things that, that happens and makes some of these cases a little counterintuitive unless you know the code. Uh, I think this is a good project too. I did want to ask, where is the transit corridor that runs, that supposedly runs through this uh, uh, compact neighborhood tier? Uh, my understanding of that is that um, while it, the, the station was previously shown um, to the west on the other side of, um, of the Davis Park East, um, let's see, so, so, sorry, let me uh, step back for a moment there. So, um, to the east of Davis Drive, there is another development, um, and there has pre previously been a plan showing the um, rail station there. However, that's not a funded um, plan, and so we are kind of stepping away from um, changing this to a design district and focusing on those um, mixed-use um, elements. 
and a compact neighborhood without um, responding specifically to a specific location of a rail. Right, but, but this is still part of, in terms of our overall planning uh, ideas for the future development of the county, we still have the string of pearls uh, that runs from Chapel Hill to Raleigh. Uh, we're acting on the Durham to Chapel Hill part, and we're focusing a lot of planning resources in turning the compact neighborhood tiers there uh, to uh, design districts because we, we anticipate light rail being installed there, but we have not gone away from the idea of the possibility of having a rail connection to Raleigh, uh, and to the airport and to Raleigh, down through the Research Triangle Park, uh, a train which actually excites me much more uh, uh, however remote it may be than the Chapel Hill connection. Um, and so uh, I think it's a good idea to, to keep these compact neighborhood tiers, to develop them so that if the train, uh, a train to Raleigh becomes something that we're going to work on, we'll be in good shape. Um, I also like it that this is a development that means that commuters to the Research Triangle Park won't have to drive all the way to Raleigh or all the way to Durham or all the way to Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm thrilled that the neighbors that came and spoke came and spoke. Uh, we do not often hear from uh, neighbors in uh, this more modern type of development for Durham, so thank you for coming. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Baker? So I think it's really interesting the the history that you presented there. Um, you know, I think a lot of new urbanist communities have, um, you know, when they first started in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, if you look at them today, you can actually see the evolution of thinking. And, uh, you know, the beginning of new urbanism, there was this clash with the, the regulations of the 90s and, and sort of the, the mentality of the 90s. And little by little, we're progressing and we're getting better and we're almost there. We're not quite there. Um, I am going to be supporting this. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, vertical mixed use is, is um, just a luxury. I think it's a necessity. And so this is definitely going in the right direction. Um, just to, wanted to um, echo Commissioner Bryan's concern about affordable housing. Um, that would be a great thing to have been able to include. Um, I wanted to ask if there are any green building elements to this. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, we're, we're working hard on creating um, the mix of uses so that you'd have a very high internal trip capture, which would reduce automobile emissions by having people only park once and then not have to move their cars again, as is common in other developments yeah. across the triangle. That's important. That's important. Um, and I, I wanted to... I wanted to say that I really appreciated the, um, some, some of the commitments that were made, in, in particular, um, some of the commitments that uh, impact the walkability mm -hmm. of uh, and sort of the um, pedestrian friendliness. Um, so uh, actually, I don't have it right in front of me, but um, you know, being that pedestrian walking down the street and being able to look through that first floor and um, uh, folks in the shop being able to look out and, and, and yeah, see pedestrians agree. as they go. It's something that makes people right. feel safer, something that makes people feel uh, much more comfortable as they walk down the street. So again, this is definitely going in the right direction and um, I appreciate this development and I'm gonna be supporting it. Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs? Uh, yeah, and I, uh, I guess to make a short story shorter, I, I'm just gonna say amen to all of this. Uh, Great comments. <laughs> <laughs> and but I, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, voice my support for this kind of development, especially in this area. You know, we've just been reading recently Research Triangle Foundation's plan uh, for the, their uh, mixed use area. I think is ready to take off. To me, this is uh, a tag along or, and it may have been planned at the same time, but to me, it's, a, it, it's something that goes with it and makes a comprehensive statement about where this area, the Research Triangle Park is going to be much different. And backing out from there toward town and the areas around, uh, this is gonna be what we're gonna be seeing more of. 
And I, and just one quick question about the, the rail. Are, were we talking about the regional rail uh, from Durham, uh, RTP, RDU, uh, and Orange County, rather than the light rail, is this the regional rail that is out there? Yes, uh, Bill Judge with transportation. So this area would uh, likely be served by the uh, Wake Durham commuter rail. Um, that major investment study is just now in its very early preliminary kickoff study stages that uh, Campo and Wake County will be working through with Go Triangle. So, I mean, there. I mean, first thing they'll be determining is yeah, just feasibility. Um, the thought is that it would be commuter type rail on the existing rail line, but where those station locations would be have not been determined yet. I mean, the previous study that um, was going to use a similar study in 2005, 2006 did have that station that Emily was referring to earlier. So, I mean, there's good possibility there'd be another station in the area, but that exact location has not been determined yet or even any timing or funding for it. Thank you, Mr. Judge. I and that the way things are changing, <laughs> it's going to be uh, the developers of the rail and the engineers and all of that. It's going to be like a dog chasing its tail. Uh, but one of these things is going to have to be in place. But I, I agree with Commissioner Miller. Uh, we need to plan for it. Uh, it, it may be a phantom line out there now, but it's, well, it's a little more than a phantom line, but uh, I'd, I'm just excited. I wish I was going to be around to see it all happen, uh, but it's, uh, this whole area to me is very exciting. Uh, it, it's, RTP was great in its day, and as we have all we all know it's sort of gotten a little quieter out there, but I think things are beginning to really pop. Uh, and I, that's enough. I still say amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, before, we, before I recognize Commissioner Al Turk, I, I did just want to mention that I, I was looking through here as well and noticed the difference between the 35,000 and 15,000 square feet of commercial. It's in a lot of spots. It's in the, if, I, if I'm reading it correctly, and I may be misunderstanding, I just wanted to mention it before, sure, before we you. move this forward to City Council. So to clarify, um, the 15,000 is in error. Um, it was pulled from the, um, the development intensity um, and copied to the other areas. So we're looking at that 35,000 um, as stated on the overview as well as in the development plan. Great, so that'll, that'll just get fixed throughout. Yes, those corrections. Fantastic, great. Yeah. But it's a typo, it's not an error that would, would change any of the calculations in any of the traffic generation reports or anything like that. I believe the traffic generation report numbers are based off of the 15,000. The, um, the square footage of the commercial has evolved through the review process. I'll let Erlene um, or Bill Judge speak to that further. Oh. That's okay. Erlene Thomas, City Transportation. Um, so the 15,000 square footage is what the traffic calculation was based off of, and the site would be limited to the total amount of trips that were approved as a part of the TIA. So they could mix and match the amounts of the different uses, but they can't exceed the number of trips that they've been approved for. So, so if they did more, uh, less office and more of the commercial, so the text commitments on the cover sheet say a maximum of this. So we maximum. should consider it as a cap, but they're still right. going to have to work within their TPD figure. It's, yes. All right. And, and you're okay with that? You don't, we don't need to fix something. No, it, okay. it's, it's all kosher. And, and that remains the case as well for the water supply. School, I mean, school systems won't be impacted, but. Uh, those, those numbers may need to be updated. Okay. And that's, that's fine. Okay, great. Commissioner Alturk, and, and let me just ask you before I recognize you, sorry. That's I okay. do support this project as well. I think it's a very thoughtful project. I think given what we're seeing in RTP, hearing from the neighbors tonight really helped sealed the deal for me, 
but I, it's a thoughtful project. It's doing the kind of things we want to see more of. So I appreciate the time that's been put into it, and I will vote for it. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. I also support this project, um, but I, I do have a couple of questions for staff. And again, this has to do with the phase, uh, the phases. Uh, I guess the first question is about, is there a minimum requirement for mixed use in terms of commercial and office? Does there have to be a minimum square footage? There, there is a minimum of sort of the ratio of uses. Okay. Um, I can pull up that section to specifically reference it. No, that's okay. But there is, so there has to be some office and commercial, right? Um, it, it can't just be, because the way I read it, right, the first phase, could, you know, the developer could build up to 280,000 square footage, square feet of residential um, before moving to the second phase. And they could only, so they might build 280,000 square feet of residential and 4,000 square feet of commercial and office. Is that correct? Or is, does it have, is the, is the second requirement that the ratios have to match? Or, right? I think question? part of what I'm asking for is, or is that some of the expect, some of the the residents mentioned that they they liked the idea of having commercial here, and and it might be good to set the expectations now, right? Um, that this would not just be mostly a residential uh, development. Sure. If I may, Mr. Chairman. So is your question: Must right. there be? Yes. Is there? Is yes. Yeah, must there be commercial? Or can they abandon commercial altogether and just build up to the limits of the other uses mentioned? So um, no single use shall occupy more than 60% of the floor area or gross acreage of the project. Um, and that's based off of the mixed use standards. Um, so there has to be a mix of uses. OK. So it could be up to 60% of the total square footage is residential. Is that, what, is that that's the maximum? OK. Um, a second question is about. Can, can you move to a second phase of residential before you do anything in office and commercial? So each phase would be, would be required to be able to stand alone um, with regards to ordinance compliance. Okay, so you have to build a minimum of 4,000 square feet of office and commercial before you build more than 280 square feet, 1,000 square feet of residential, is that correct? I believe so. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but referencing the phasing chart um, and the standards of the uh, mix of uses. Okay. Is, I, I also saw some nodding heads. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I think that helps because I, um, I think it's important that it does, the mixed use nature of it is, is clear to residents and to, to us from the beginning of the project. And I uh, echo uh, comments from other commissioners. I think this is a, a good project. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, I just wanted to further comment on what Commissioner Al Turk was bringing up. If we look at the vertical integration of uses, I'm thinking, I'm not trying to make you commit to anything, that you're probably going to have commercial on the bottom, maybe office above that, or maybe in some places office on the bottom, and then residential on top. Right. And if you look at it that way, it means that you're probably going to have to have at least two or three just to get the building built. Mm -hmm. I, Patrick, I thought you told me there was going to be a revolving restaurant on the top of the taller building. <laughs> <laughs> that was not Any, a commitment. I'll neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> Mr. Bryan, any additional questions that's or it. comments? That's it. I think we're at the appropriate time for a motion again. If anyone else wants to join will, in, Commissioner Alter, we'll leave well, Commissioner you. Bryan of his Thank duties. You. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Let me see if I can do it as well as he does. I move that we send case Z1800014 to the city with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved by Commissioner Al Turk and uh, seconded by Commissioner Bryan. And we'll have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Tara Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. And Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Motion passes 13 to 0. Thanks to all of you for coming Thank out you tonight. Thank for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. We're at our final case this evening. This is case Z180018.
one and the 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 project is one two two eight Carroll Street. Are there two zoning requests? I have two sheets. We all do. We'll start with the staff report. Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will now be presenting case Z18000181228, 1228 Carroll Street. The applicant is Jess Brandis with CASA. This 5.471 acre site is located at 1228 Carroll Street. This site is located within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from RU5 and RU52 to residential urban multifamily with a development plan, RUMD. The property is designated medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. The proposal consists of a maximum of 65 multifamily residential units. This site is shown in red, located at the intersection of Carroll Street and West Lakewood Avenue in the urban development tier. The site photos show that the property was previously an Army Reserve Center and contains an existing building, garage structures, and surface parking. The western portion of the site is heavily wooded. These area photos show that the site is adjacent to single-family residential structures as well as Lion Park. The site is presently zoned residential urban and residential urban with duplexes, RU5 and RU52. The applicant proposes to change this designation to residential urban multifamily with a development plan. The property is designated medium density residential on the future land use map which is consistent with the rezoning request. The development plan provides site access points, building and parking envelopes, tree preservation, and project boundary buffers. Key commitments include that the proposed development will be constructed in phases with up to 65 units. The use is limited to residential and the building type limited to apartment or multiplex. Building height will be limited to two stories within 75 feet of the street frontage and three stories for the remainder of the site. A 20-foot wide greenway easement will be provided. And a minimum of 30% tree preservation is shown on the development plan. The proposed RUMD zoning designation complies with the current medium density residential designation on the future land use map and applicable policies. It is consistent with policy 231A, 232A, 8414B. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you. We will open the public hearing. We have upwards of seven individuals. A few may have had to leave early, they noted. Seven who were wishing to speak for the proposal and one against. And we will start with those in favor. And our first speaker is uh, Jess Brandes. Hello. Thank you for Got it. Is it going to come up? Uh, uh, good evening. I'm Jess Brandes. Um, I'm with CASA. I'm the CASA Senior Director of Real Estate Development. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, um, Debbie White, our CFO, Evelyn Worthy, our Senior Director of um, Property Management, um, and I'm gonna leave that alone until somebody comes and helps me. Um, I'm also joined by our design team, uh, Dan Jewell and Jeremy Anderson, and I'm gonna be brief because I know we have a lot of people sign up to speak. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about who CASA is, cover our vision for this site, talk about why we're undertaking this rezoning, touch on the neighborhood um, engagement we've had, and then lastly, proffer an additional commitment um, that we're making tonight. Um, should I try to do this? Clickety-click and just pull it up. Yeah, let's see. If you have a presentation, that'd be great so the folks yeah. at home can see it I'm as gonna well. I'm going to do. And I will that's note not... that we we give each side 10 minutes. If we need more than 10 minutes, that's something that no, we No, you don't can... need more than 10 minutes. 
for everybody. Oh, okay. For everybody on each side. So there are okay. seven in favor. So if you do need additional time, we, we can consider that. But please, you know. please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll be quick. So CASA is a local nonprofit. We're in our 27th year of building, owning, and managing affordable housing. That's what we do. Um, we have kind of these three activities. We build communities. We maintain our properties ourselves. And we support our tenants in their housing through partnering with agencies that provide services. Um, here are some images of uh, other properties we've developed recently. Um, we currently own and manage almost 500 multifamily units throughout the Triangle and serve a variety of households in need of affordable housing. Specific to this project and specific to all four of these examples I'm showing you, we're serving individuals and families with disabilities who have experienced homelessness. So our vision for Carroll Street is basically this, a beautiful and transformational community of affordable, safe, stable homes for Durham households who've experienced homelessness. Specific to this, we are um, expecting an amenity-rich and service-connected community, including on-site management office, community space, and supportive services for our tenants. As was mentioned by staff, preservation of 30% of the site for forest and individual um, old oaks on the site as practicable. We're envisioning collaboration with Parks and Rec, not only the Greenway easement, but we're having conversations with Parks and Rec about other ways to include amenities that would be available to our tenants and the broader community. Hands-on property management is key to everything that CASA does, all of our work throughout the Triangle, and significant long-term oversight by our funding partners of the project. And lastly, we, as staff mentioned, are seeing this vision come to life over time. We're currently um, uh, collecting funds and planning for the first phase of development, which will just be 16 units. And we envision the 65 units um, being developed over many years. Why we're undertaking this rezoning is basically three reasons. The first and the most important one is it's consistent with our mission, which is to develop and manage affordable housing. This land is being conveyed to CASA from the federal government at no cost to us. And so we want to capitalize on this incredible opportunity for CASA and for the tenants and for Durham um, and help as many households as we're able to who are experiencing homelessness. And rezoning this allows us to help uh, to do more in two ways. First, it allows us to build some more units. We're requesting 65 over the current zoning, which would permit 43. And additionally, it allows us to build those units in a more efficient way by building apartment buildings instead of single family homes or duplexes, which are more efficient, more um, less expensive to build and less expensive to maintain long term. Secondly, we're doing this because of flexibility. Um, this rezoning allows us to have more flexibility in the design of a site in a way that's more compatible with the neighborhood and in our ability to achieve our vision of preserving forests, including recreational amenities. Developing under the current zoning, the 43 single family homes that are currently permitted would involve significant tree removal, uh, grading, and additional paving. And lastly, as staff mentioned, it's um, consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, Neighborhood outreach is, is, was not required. No neighborhood meeting was required for this, but we're very grateful for all the conversations we've had and all the engagement. I think we've uh, really come to a much better end product because of all the conversations. So I'm thankful for everyone who's been part of this process so far um, and continues to be. Um, but we did send out an initial introductory letter back in July. We held two neighborhood meetings. One was in September and one was in December. And we've had lots of uh, you know other engagement activities um, and uh, minutes from meetings, PowerPoint presentations, FAQs, a copy of our development plan, all of that stuff as it's been um, ongoing has been put on CASA's website and the communication to neighbors, we've been trying to direct them back to the website so that everyone's kind of getting all the same information. And lastly, I'm going to proffer an additional commitment, um, which is in response to neighborhood feedback, which we heard was concerns about safety at the, um, at the proposed Lakewood Avenue curb cut, and so we're committing to making that a right-in, right-only entry point. Do you mind just saying that again, uh, the proffer? Sure. We are committing to making the Lakewood entry point right in, right out only. Thank you. Yep. That's all. Great. We will, um, our next speaker is Dan Jewell. Thank you. And then Brian Schweiderman and Shannon Mallory, if you're still here. I know they may have to leave early. You're still here? Please come on up. Hi, Brian Schneiderman, 1408 Carroll Street. So I live about a block and a half away from the, um, from the project. And I've lived in my house for, since 2010. 
Um, and these days, I walk almost every day past the site with my kids on the way to the school. And so I've got to admit, you know, having been there for uh, a little over eight years, walking by that property and seeing it, it's as, as you might know, as you can, from the armory, it's an eyesore. And it's, even, even when it was in use, it wasn't in much use. And as we all know, derelict properties are not really valuable for the neighborhood, nor do they build more community. Um, and so as a neighbor, I'm really thrilled to see this project being developed and actually uh, in partnership with CASA, that it has the potential to actually be part of the community as opposed to separate from the community. Um, I must admit, I have a little bias. I'm a fan of affordable housing. I actually have the privilege of doing some work in affordable housing. Um, and with the growing shortage of affordable housing that is well discussed in Durham, I think this is a unique opportunity in Durham that we actually don't see on a regular basis. And with the um, continued gentrification, it's actually these opportunities are shrinking versus increasing. Um, and if truth be told, um, I actually really value the promise um, in the neighborhood because in this neighborhood in particular, we're seeing a greater amount of gentrification. And so when I moved in, I think the demographics of the community are changing very rapidly. And I think actually having a long-term anchor that creates economic diversity in the, in the neighborhood and the community is something I value as, um, as a neighbor. Um, and then the last I would say is, so given I've had a chance to work in affordable housing, uh, I've gotten to work with a number of nonprofit developers over the time, and I've had um, some experience with CASA, and my experience is that they're a very strong developer. And so of the potential partners, I'm really thankful that they've won the bid from the federal government uh, and really appreciate them actually trying to create an open process. Obviously, you know, after, after the change in zoning, they're going to continue to develop. I do trust that they will continue that ongoing conversation and really work in partnership uh, with community um, and in getting to work with them on a regular basis. I know I'd be one that would try and hold their feet to the fire on that. Um, and um, I think, again, uh, I just, uh, I guess we just wrap up with, I recommend approval for this project and rezoning. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. We have two additional speakers in favor, Evelyn Worthy and Debbie White. Oh, and they're just answering questions. Okay, they're they're also here to answer questions. Yes. Oh, you wish to speak as well. I'm sorry. I We will we will have time. <laughs> yeah, cool. Hello, my name is Shannon Mallory. I live at 1315 <coughs> Carroll Street, which is four houses away from the site. I um, do walk my children to school every day, pass the site as well. For me, it's not so much of an eyesore, but I will tell you that I do welcome affordable housing in Durham. I've seen a lot of regentrification. Um, the house that I live in is 1,250 square feet, mm -hmm. and that's a family of four there. So one of the things that I see happening in our neighborhood is many of the smaller affordable homes are being turned into bigger, larger, fancier, less affordable homes. Um, one of the things that I'm very grateful to CASA for doing is working with the neighborhood. I've met with Jess Brandis myself, and um, it being an older building, it has asbestos and the potential for lead paint. CASA thankfully has agreed to do a wet demolition as a best practice, so that's a wonderful um, attribute that they are going to bring to this project, which I very much support. I also like the possible integration of something from Parks and Rec on the property. I think that's a very good way to go. I would say with the 65 units, and maybe it's naive from a financial perspective of what CASA is trying to accomplish, is to say we can support um, this very low tier of financial status person, but also this middle class home is disappearing even in this neighborhood of Durham. So as you look at your development of 65 units over the long term, I know that it is a government housing project, but say maybe there is a way that we can bring that middle income bracket of housing into this as well. So we're not just servicing the very poor and the very rich in our neighborhood, but supporting that middle class housing as well as more and more of the housing changes over to those two types in our neighborhood. Thank you. And please come, if you don't mind, if you can give us your name and your address and then your remarks. Uh, Karen Zinwatsalemi. 
if you can come up to the mic first to, for the folks at home. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Benoit Salemi. I live at 1020 Wells, which is about a block and a half from the project. And I'm super in support of the project. I really agree with everything that Shannon said about and that Brian said about gentrification, which is like really going on in our neighborhood a lot. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood for 25 years, maybe. Um, and I, I just have the, the one thing that I've talked, I've mentioned to Jess and there have been neighborhood uh, conversations about, and I speak for another neighbor who could not be here tonight. Um, we have near our neighborhood over on Moorhead, there are, there's horrible um, garbage problems. And I understand on this new project um, that it is required to have the garbage um, dumpster, you know, within a, within some sort of a, a containment. Um, I think it's going to be brick, you said. Um, but I would, I'm also just aware that places that you see those containments, there are often, um, maybe they'll have wooden doors on them that are kind of broken after a while and bulging. And um, I think particularly since, since there's this problem over on Moorhead Avenue, which in Chapel Hill, just off of Chapel Hill Street, uh, Chapel Hill Road, um, which is just an eyesore uh, that, I, that I drive by almost every day. And it's always garbage everywhere. And I understand, I'm really grateful for this project that you're going to have some on-site um, supervision. Um, and I could even come and give people lessons <laughs> about how to take care of the garbage, if it would come to that. Anyway, so but I'm definitely um, excited about having the project there. Great, thank Maybe you. Maybe that was a silly thing to talk about. No, thank you very much. And we have one individual signed up to speak against, Justin Plant. Hey there, as you mentioned, I'm Justin Plant. Uh, thanks for being here, thanks for having me. Um, I'm not a politician or, or a lawyer or, or whatnot, so I'm simply a family man. I've, I moved here uh, from Wisconsin a long time ago, but I uh, have been moved, lived in this house for three years. I live at 1107 West Lakewood Ave, which is right across the street. Um, I have a wife and a three-year-old and a six-month-old, and we, we love where we live, and we, we really enjoy the, the community that we're a part of. Um, my, my biggest concerns are a density thing. I, I don't know that... Uh, filling the area with 65 units is something that's conducive to the situation that we, we live in and that I, I moved to and promised my family to. Um, there's a park right across the street. I walk across there daily on our way, on our morning walks to the co-op, on our morning walks to Lion Park. Um, and I'm, mostly I'm concerned about the density problem. Um, and I feel like that a rezoning of putting 65 units versus 44 um, is, is putting that many more in there, I feel like is not as necessary. I feel like that could be, uh, that, that solution could be implemented somewhere further in the downtown area where people who need the public access to transportation and and food and and, and whatnot um, would be better off in like in that situation. Um, but my my other large concern is I don't know that it has to do anything with the rezoning, but I live right across the street, and if we pull up what is on the screen right here, somebody. Maybe, perhaps. Uh, you'll see that my house is, I'm, a, I'm on that triangle lot, right by the right in, right out only. I am literally across the street from that, and that is my front door, that is my child's room, and that is my kitchen. And I'm not very excited about having the traffic of outcoming traffic right into my, my front door. And I'm wondering if there's possibly a way Jess, you know, I've talked to Jess. She's been very receptive and, and welcoming to my concerns. So I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to working with her. Um, I, I do also want to mention that I, I think CASA is probably our best choice 
for this for this location. I wouldn't recommend anybody else. I don't know anybody else who'd be better fit for that area. Um, but I would like strong consideration from Jess and from the, the city to understand my concerns as the person who is dealing with the outgoing traffic and the density problem that, problem is probably a strong word. We live in a growing city and density is a thing that we have to deal with on a, on a daily basis, you more so than I do. Um, so anyhow, uh, those are those are just my thoughts and feelings. Um, I do think that some of the, <laughs> uh, I don't know, benefits of, or, or like the fact that they would be preserving trees is a little uh, one-sided. There's not, they're not gonna build into the park. They're not gonna build on that grade. So I wouldn't consider that as a very strong argument for why they should be there. But I do think Casa. <laughs> I was just I'm, that's my argument against that particular point. I wanted to be fair that that uh, that some of these arguments are not necessarily logical. They're just convenient. Um, but anyhow, I appreciate your time and do what you will. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Anyone else who want to speak on this issue? I don't see anyone else. Yes. I, I, you may be called up by one of us after we close the public hearing, so it's good to know that you may have that interest. So uh, we will now move to, yes, sir. Would you like to speak at, during the public hearing process? Please come on up. Thank you. Commissioners, my name is Chad Bebo. I'm here uh, speaking on behalf of 1112 Arnett Avenue, which is about two and a half, three blocks, I guess, at the corner of Cobb and Arnett. Um, I'm here with my wife, and um, the property at issue um, is her family home. Um, I guess what we're best defined tonight as a, one of the gentrifiers, and that means that we're moving into her family home and fixing it up with renovations and extensive um, renos and a terrible expense to, to my family. I guess that's what we are. Um, the first time we learned about this was three days ago when we received the notice from the city. Um, and um, we're going to I guess start paying attention to it. Uh, I realized there was no necessary community outreach, but we would have appreciated a letter or somebody to knock on our door. Um, I do agree with the argument that 65, we were looking forward to neighbors, of course, that is a blighted area, but 65 properties sounds like a lot, and beautiful community from those three photos they showed up there is not what I saw tonight. So, um, that's it. I didn't prepare to speak tonight, um, but thank you very much for addressing me. Okay, thank you. So we will close the public hearing, and at this point, we'll look for commissioners. I know Commissioner Miller wished to speak. Any other commissioners? Mm -hmm. If you don't mind keeping your hands up just for a moment, but Commissioner Miller, why don't you get started? So if I can ask Ms. Brandis a couple of questions, and I'll begin with a comment I have, if you've served with me long, I, I generally am quick to object to uh, rezoning arguments that are based on things that are not committed. And there, as I see this, there's no commitment to affordable housing in this development plan. Uh, and we talk about a service-rich environment, but there's no commitment to any sort of services on this development plan. And hands-on property management, there's no commitment to that in the development plan. So we've talked about a lot of things which, at least looking at the development plan and the zoning code, don't have to happen. But I am also aware that this is an unusual property transaction and that the United States government's been involved and it's, and it's 
deeded this as a gift on conditions. And so maybe some of my concerns go away simply because they're not in the development plan doesn't mean that there isn't an affordable housing requirement that comes from another source. Is that so? Yes. Yeah, the, the federal government requirements of this process, Transfer. it's called the McKinney-Vento Title 10, I think, uh, it's a regulation that governs this, dictates that the property must serve uh, persons who have experienced homelessness. And so what does affordable housing mean? in the context of this project. It's a word we throw around a lot yes. in Durham, and it can mean different things to different speakers, and I want to know what it means to you, and if there is a commitment related to it, I want you to articulate it to me. Well, what, the, what that federal statute that overs, you know, the, uh, uh, governs the conveyance, um, the maximum income is 50% of area median income, uh, which changes from time to time right now, it's about 32,000 for a household of two, about 20. 50% AMI is good Correct. enough. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what about the service rich environment and hands on property management? Help me to understand, we talked about those things, but they're not commitments. And uh, so you, if this passes, you don't actually have to do them even though you said them. Well, that's what CASA does. I mean, that's our, that's, you know, what, what we do. I appreciate um, that, but we, we don't grant rezonings on status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Are there commitments you'd be willing to make? I mean, yeah, we can commit to, you know, the affordability restrictions. Well, no, you don't need to do that. You've got law mm -hmm. on your side there. Uh, what about uh, on-site management? And, or, and I don't know what service rich means. And I think we'll recognize staff at the, mo the moment. Uh, yes, uh, Grace Smith with the Planning Department. Um, we were just com confirm conferring among ourselves. We, we're pretty sure that we, um, the Planning Department, cannot enforce the management aspect as a commitment, the, the management of the property. We can't enforce that. Um, that just wanted to make sure that you... That no, that's good to know, because that's, we, we that's part of my point. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to enforce that, that type of a commitment. And... But I'm not sure what service rich means. What kind of services? Um, we partner with organizations in the community. The um, partner we'd be working with here is Alliance Behavioral Healthcare. Um, we have a long history of working with them. And um, you know, our tenants who have a disability um, may have a variety of service needs. They may have you know assistance with um, they may need case management, assistance with locating services like childcare, things like that. But it's the services are determined by the. Uh, case management provider, the service provider, and they're based on the individual needs of the tenant and what those tenants' goals are. All right. I, I appreciate that. I just want to make sure. I intend to vote for this, uh, but I'm as a planning commission member, I always want to make sure that we're operating within the rules and that we vote for things based upon what the code requires and what the developers' com enforceable commitments are, and that we are not voting in favor of or perhaps against a rezoning based upon promises that are not really material to the question. Uh, I live ne not too far away from a CASA project. I'm a big fan. I think that project has worked out better than I ever thought it would when I first heard you speak at a, at a, a planning commission meeting. I was not a com commission member then. Uh, so I'm a big fan, uh, but still, I want to make sure that we are voting based upon what what must happen on the property and not uh, based upon a, a promise that may or may not occur. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner Miller brought up or asked a question that I wanted to ask, which is um, about uh, Commitments to affordability. So let me make let me clarify, I guess, with staff. So we don't need in here a text commitment to say that people who have experienced homelessness have to live here, right? And that it has to be 50% of AMI, or it has to cater to people who have whose incomes is 50% of AMI. Is that correct? Are those two requirements not needed? This particular applicant has already entered into an agreement with the federal government that they must okay. do that. Okay. So, 
And is it, can I ask can I ask the applicant then it, um, how long how many years does this do you have to commit? It'll to? be at least thirty years. Okay, thirty years. A mm -hmm. um, follow-up question to that. Uh, another question. I guess um, I'm a I'm, a, I'm obsessed with the phasing intensities today. Um, I'm, so why do this in phases? Why the 16 units and then up to 65? Because we don't have the money to build 65 units right okay. away. Okay. Um, we are a nonprofit that accepts right. donations, so we were welcome that, so we can uh, develop our phases faster. But uh, 16 units was something uh, very much within our wheelhouse of something we've done before that we would we have a we also have a ticking clock from the federal government. So we wanted something that we knew was achievable, both from a financial point of view and from uh, getting the units on the ground within the time frame that we were given by the feds. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm. I'm also supportive of this this project. Um, I, I do want to address the the comment by some of the neighbors, in particular about the traffic. Uh, I, I understand that that um, you know that that is going to be a lot more traffic than you're used to, and you're right there where you know cars will be going in and out. Um, you know that's something that is you know difficult to see. I think w one thing that from the staff report that may not give you much solace, but that helps me at least, is that um, if this was not rezoned, uh, if and if someone built 43 single family lots here, the, the transportation department you know, predicts that you would have an increase of 478 vehicle, uh, uh, vehicle trips per day. Uh, but if we rezone this, uh, to 63 or 65 multi-family multi-family units, the transportation department predicts that there will be 450 vehicle trips. I know it's it's you know it's still extra, but uh, but it is less than what it currently is zoned at. And so you know I um, because of that, and because I think we do need density in, in Durham, I, I I think this is a, a good project, and I, I will be I'm inclined to support this unless I hear. From other commissioners uh, with concerns. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Durkin. I, I just wanted to, I was wondering how you're financing it. You said you only had the financing for 16, but is that? Correct, yeah. We finance our projects through a variety of funding partners. Um, we have a award we got about a couple weeks ago from a new funding partner, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. Um, a, a new funder for CASOS is the only project they funded in the state of North Carolina this cycle. Um, so we have those dollars already in the door. We're seeking funds from the city of Durham through uh, home dollars. And um, we'll be financing it through bank financing, community out, uh, community donations, probably some other sources. So the FHLB and the home money have restrictions in addition Correct. to what the- Yes, um, yeah, the FHLB have restrictions over a 15 year period. Um, the home dollars come with restrictions. Um, for you know at least 20 years. So, so the funding has restrictions. The funding also, when I mentioned the long-term oversight from the funding partners, those partners they do physical inspections of the units. They're out on the site. They're you know auditing us annually. So there's there's a lot of oversight besides just you know ca taking Casa's word for it um, that that all these these partners with long-term obligations in that property will be um, double-checking on it. I'm really excited about this project. I'm not in the notice area, but I'm a Moorhead Hill neighbor. Um, so I'm very excited about it. I also <laughs> am biased in favor of affordable housing, so that gets me every time, basically. Um, I am also a fan of the density for the use of this property and would much rather see 65 plus units versus 43 on it. I think it's a more efficient use of the land, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the development of the project. Commissioner Bryan, were you looking to be recognized? Yes. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, it, Talking about the future phases, and the land use is limited to the multifamily residential, but in parentheses it says with accessory community buildings. Could you elaborate on what that means? Yeah, I don't know if that's, yeah, what we, that's for the, um, you know, accessory spaces associated with, with rental apartments, so a leasing space, and then um, typically we develop, we have a community space uh, that's available for meetings um, and activities with the residents and typically in our developments. We also make that available to other community groups who can rent it out. Um, it's kind of a multi-use space with a kitchen and meeting area. Um, and so just those, those types of things that will support the, the activities of the tenants and the leasing staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
some questions for staff. I'll start with uh, transportation. Um, there was a new commitment to have a right in, right out on the Lakewood. And I just want to make sure that transportation is okay with that. Um, Early and Thomas Transportation, we will need some additional time to review that um, newly proffered commitment, but feel that we can review it before the council meeting. Okay, so uh, if if we voted for it tonight, you wouldn't have a problem with us doing that? Oh, no. Thank you. Uh, I also am supportive of this project. I, I like to see that we're bringing some affordable housing in. Uh, one comment regarding 65, I think 65 is a good number myself, but I also don't think it's gonna happen overnight. Uh, man, this is a, you got a 30 year commitment here. I hope it doesn't take you 30 years to get them all built, but it, it's something that's going to be gradual, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to the applicant, just, uh, just some quick questions. So what is the anticipated cost of phase one, just the total development cost for that? Ooh, um, just over $3 million. Three million. And then the second phase? Well, we, you know, we will, we're not sure what that's going to look like. It may be multiple phases. We may do, you know, 20 units. We may do uh, 40 at a time. It's, it's, as funds become available, we want to have a site where we can you know, capitalize on those sources. And so with the conveyance of the, the property from the federal government, uh, in the event of default in regards to you meeting the, the metrics and milestones and guidance governance, what happen, what are the, uh, events, uh, default events in regards to you not meeting those requirements? There's sort of a series of steps um, and of kind of penalties, and the worst case scenario is it gets, give, it goes back to the federal government. Mm -hmm. It kind of sees it at the end of the day. Um, or CASA's paying a portion of, you know, they, they take the tax value of it and splice it based on how long you utilized it and you owe them for the like balance. recapture or something. Yeah, a recapture provision. I think those are kind of, there's, and there's several steps, you know, first it's, you know, a letter and um, things like that. But the, the government's kind of, you know, final authority would be to seize the property back. And so based on your business model for this particular development project, what are the major risks that could cause this project beyond vertical and COI to not fulfill this promise and you basically... For us not to build our 16 What makes this fail? What are your risk factors so that this, this project fails? Um, where we don't complete our first 16 units? Well, you, can, you build them out. Mm -hmm. you, you get people in. Like, what, what are your, what your SWOT analysis? Like, is it that you have to have enough revenue to meet your expenses, da, da, da. What, what can cause this project to be like, Casa has to leave or mm -hmm. find a, someone to take over his position? Or? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, building and managing affordable housing is hard. <laughs> if, exactly. right. if it was easy, we'd have more of it. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, our, our staff over here who are looking every day at what are our, what's our income. Um, we have, you know, many units throughout the triangle. And so keeping ourselves solvent, making sure our rental incomes are Covering our expenses is something we're looking at daily so that we're, you know, we also have significant reserves that are, you know, required for us to be held where we have lots of reserves that are based on the number of units that we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a little, I'm thinking a little bit, you know, any, any owner could go bankrupt and lose their property. Um, if that were the case with CASA in our bylaws as a nonprofit, our properties would convey to another nonprofit of similar purpose, also serving affordable housing. So that was what would happen if um, if that occurred. You know, we've never had a we've never had a default in our 27 year history um, on a loan or any on any obligation. Um, so I don't I I anticipate that obviously. Um, okay. This is Debbie White, our CFO. <laughs> uh, yeah. Really, uh, I think we 
have to stand on our balance sheet and on our financial strength. CASA has been in business for 27 years. We have over $28 million of property on our balance sheet. So I'm not saying that what we would want to, but if we had to sell a property that was out of its period of restriction in order to generate funds, we would be able to do that and accomplish that. Um, okay, that, that's helpful. Okay. There's a one final question is to uh, just get, get some insight on the, the comments by the op opposition, the opposition comments. So could this, based on your conception of conceptual vision and business plan, could this work with 43? I think you said for existing right now, you could do 43. Or could this project happen if you were at the 43, 44, whatever it is, uh, unit level? Well, um, yeah, we'd be, you know, we would develop as many units as we're able to develop uh, for the population that we're that we're serving. So economic, like from a financial viability standpoint, like you don't need to have a certain scale. Correct. For Our for request work. for increased density is not because of some cost per unit. Gotcha. It's because we want to serve an extra 22 families in need. Gotcha. That's helpful. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Yeah, just most of the questions uh, that were asked have been answered, but uh, a couple questions as far as kind of King off the last conversation was, um, do you see that this each phase is profitable as far as you know starting out with the 16, then moving to maybe 20, or that each one will be profitable on their own and they'll be self-sufficient there? Yeah, all of our properties, you know, we we model them to uh, be uh, in the black as standalone entities. Mm -hmm. um, so this will, yeah, the first 16 units will be phase one. It'll be a it's standalone property. Um, the deed restrictions associated with the funding will just be tied to that uh, phase one. And then subsequent phases would have to, uh, you know, show their own merits to be able to move into a next phase. So as you raise money and as you go Correct. to the next phase, then you make that decision to move forward. To Correct. The we will be undertaking a master planning process so that as that happens, it's doing so in a really intentional way, but we'll be looking at funding sources that are available going forward and saying, okay, that would be a match for doing 20 more units. Let's let's run the numbers. Let's put together our pro forma. Um, let's see what funding sources we need and um, make the decision to move ahead with subsequent phases based on that analysis. Okay. And then looking at the, the, the plan right now that you have for the development plan, this is just the phase one for the 16 units, or is that a, the full build out or is that? This development plan covers the whole site. Okay. So this, the development plan shows here would be the- For the 65 units? Yeah, for the whole, yeah. Okay. The 65 units will be, you know, within this five- Within that five footprint years. that you've-, you've Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm kind of in favor of it, and I'm definitely in, and uh, applaud you for involving the community and hearing the community, you know, excitement about seeing something change there. Hey, thank you, Commissioner Morgan. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I applaud you, ma'am. I'm in full support of this project. I just had a question. It kind of ran through my mind. This is, like you say, a transfer from the federal government to your organization. Okay. That building goes back quite a bit of ways with me. My father served in that building. In the, it was the old 108th Artillery Division. And, and back in the 1960s, he was in that unit. Uh, my question is, is in, in this transfer, I can remember when that end of Carroll Street was still dirt and they would spray that road out there with oil, you know, to keep the, the dust down. And I, I can assure you, I know inside that building you're going to find lead, paint, asbestos, and no telling whatever. And I'm worried about over on the end where the motor pool was on that end. Has there been any environmental assessment or anything on that? Or have you just the federal government saying, you take it, it's y'all's, whatever you find, y'all have to deal with it. Um, we have done asbestos inspection. We've, uh, you know, we, there's a presumption of lead-based paint, so as Shannon said, well, you know, I'm we're, sure it's full you know, we're treating full it like, a, it, yeah. like a, a, a lead hazard demo, because uh, we know there'll be lead-based paint in there. Um, and we have conducted uh, some, we did a phase one environmental assessment, and we've done some um, soil borings 
as well to look at uh, some areas where we saw some suspected contamination. Yes, ma'am. Well, so, I'll say yeah, so we're, we're waiting to hear back from, we're was. waiting to hear back about um, what the next steps are. Right. Well, that's, that was my concern, and especially in the area of that end where the old uh, motor pool area mm -hmm. was. But I, I'm in full support of it. Commissioner Baker. Um, I, you know, echo some of um, Commissioner Miller's comments that we need to be looking at this, not just based on the fact that um, CASA um, is developing it, but um, would we be comfortable with anyone um, who, who might be in ownership of it? Um, I am. Um, I'm going to be supporting this. Uh, I appreciate some of the very thoughtful comments, both in favor and against this. Um, I thought that I thought that those were very good comments and very helpful to us. And I think to you, I saw you taking notes. Um, and hopefully, you'll be able to work through any any differences of opinion that you might have. Um, I also think that it's thoughtful that um, on the development plan we see uh, limitations to building height. There's a step back requirement. A step back requirement. So there's. Um, two-story maximum building height as well as a three-story maximum building height on the site. Um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of the developments that come before us um, can occasionally be discouraging. Um, I find this development proposal uh, very encouraging. Um, I'd love to imagine a society where this was the norm and not some sort of uh, wild exception that it um, seems to actually be. So um, for the first time and maybe the only, only time, I want to actually say you know, thank you and I encourage you to keep doing this and appreciate the work that you're doing in Durham and, and in area. So thank you. Commissioner Hyman, Vice Chair Hyman. <laughs> thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, you mentioned that you have your partnering with Alliance Behavioral Health. Is that your only partner this time? Will you partner with other agencies? Um, so right now, you mentioned Alliance, and I'm particularly interested in Alliance Behavioral Health because it is a carve-out of an agency that at one time was within Durham County government. So I'm very familiar with that population uh, of individuals and who you're working with, and I think that's very important and critical to the fact that that population is being addressed. So now, partnership. So right now, is that your only partner? That's our that's our main partner. Um, typically, when a tenant um, submits a rental application to us, they um, often are being referred by, from a service provider, right. and that service provider can be a, a you know a broad spectrum of organizations. Um, that, the, you know, sometimes it's someone under Alliance Behavioral Healthcare. Someone, uh, sometimes it's the VA. The VA is one of our big service providers. Uh, CEFs, is one of our main service providers, they're based here in Durham and in Chapel Hill. So if a if a tenant comes to us connected through services, and that's going to be who we're who we're working with in partnership with the tenant, um, is that service provider, regardless of of who they if they're affiliated with Alliance or not. Okay. Okay. That was. And the other part, uh, other question that I'd like to ask. We have very strict uh, notification rules about um, to residents who are within the, um, you know, within the project area. So I was a little bit concerned that I did hear one resident say that he did not hear about the project for, or heard about the project within three days. So I really wanted to know whether or not, and I wanted the resident to know that there is a process. And uh, so if someone, you know, would, uh, from staff would basically address that, and then so that we understand that there is a notification process, the fact that you did not hear for, you know, with, within a three-day period is not a part of the process. So. We're happy to look into that, but I do want to point out that we, um, we notify by mail any property owners within 600 feet and any um, neighborhood organizations within 1,000 feet for uh, this property, this, or this project, uh, those ordinance uh, requirements have changed recently, but for the site, it was 600 and 1,000. It is also posted um, in the newspaper. Okay, so that's for it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to move to the speed round of questions. We have Commissioner Al Turk and Commissioner Miller and Commissioner Bryan with follow up questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, since I brought up traffic and I don't think my argument was very convincing, um, I do think that there was a resident that wanted to bring up that issue, so I wanted to give her the chance to to talk about that if you're still interested. And please come up to the microphone, but yes, if a 
After the public hearing is closed, if a commissioner directs a question, you can come up and address that question, please. Thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to say I hope that we can take a very, very close look at the specific geographic layout of um, Lakewood and Carroll Street there. I know that you're talking about a right in and right out entry only, but it's very, very, very dangerous. It's up a curve. It's like on a hill, it goes up a curve. And then in the opposite direction, it's almost impossible to see. So even making that concession is going to be a very, very tricky traffic situation. And I know that there is currently, you know, the Army base is on Carroll Street, and there's not a lot going on as far as cars parking on Carroll Street on that block, on the Fort, is it the 11, is it the 1200 block there? So I would just say, and also on the back, there's kind of a pathway that leads down into Lion Park neighborhood and down to the community center that's not used. I would almost say, can you look at it a little bit more creatively, right? So that is a good concession for Lakewood, but maybe you want to think a little bit outside of the box of just Lakewood because geographically, it's, it's just very, very dangerous. And adding any anything else to that, I think, would be a very tricky business to make safe. So I would say, when you're looking at it, be very thoughtful in the approach of what you think is safe for the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, I would, I would encourage the applicant and the transportation department to do that, um, to make sure that we address some of the issues um, in traffic. And you're welcome you to, you're, yeah. Do you have you. any comments to that or? No, no, not really. I mean, that's, okay. yeah, we definitely want to work with, um, work with staff to figure out the best way to do that. I mean, um, thinking about that connection at Alliant Park had me thinking, you know, that's possibly uh, reaching back out to Parks and Rec and seeing kind of there's a, you know, if they have any ideas about better connectivity from a pedestrian point of view um, in that area as well. Um, and we've said, you know, I, when I spoke with uh, Mr. Plant earlier today and we've uh, spoke with a, a neighbor across the street from our other intersection, um, so we've we've heard some concerns about exactly where the driveway location will be, and we've talked about you know those arrows shown on the plan are, are a pretty broad area, and that within that you know we're we're happy if as much as we have wiggle room to work with homeowners to see how how you know we can move it out of the way of interfering with their access into and out of their property. So I'm glad that we have a contact information for both of those those owners who brought that to our attention. Great. Any additional questions? I know it's getting late, but I would like to uh, ask, is it Brian or Mr. Mr. Plant? Mr. Plant, yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay. And if you have a, if, do you have a specific question that should well, be addressed? I, if you'd like to address uh, either of the last two comments. Uh, I don't have a specific, I'll, I'll specific make a question, quick, but I. I, I my, my main concern is right here at the intersection um, of Lakewood and Carroll is, a, is the top of a hill. It is curved and then once you get to the bottom of the hill, it curves again. I'm wondering if, this layout here where the right in, right out only is, is that our only option? Because that is clearly like the, the, where the arrow is, is, is like whether it's left or right, that points right into my house. And I'm wondering if there's any thing that the, the council can do to, to help position that in a different area, especially considering that the parking lot must be behind the units given that they can't have a parking lot between the street and the units, I don't know that that's the best spot for it anyhow. So I, I appreciate you bringing me up here and it's my concern. Thank you. Thank you for- Chair Busby, may I, may I, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, staff has a concern that you, you're, you, you've ventured into, you've almost opened the public hearing back up. So it, please, it, it, we, I, we need to- I understand, but I do, if, if a commissioner does ask Someone a question, a question and that, that's what that I've been asking them. A, what do you want to just say in general, like yes. public comments? And that is why we I would just like to keep that in check. Because if you would like to reopen it, you can do that. No, but. we are not reopening the public hearing. But what I am doing is asking commissioners when they ask someone a question, be specific. A specific question. And we only answer what the question. Yeah, we didn't really hear addressing. an actual question. It was more like my, what my question comments? was for oh, yeah. him to be able to address. Yeah. Uh, sir, no, actually, no, no, I'm sorry. No. That's we, fine. We are, we're just I, making I, sure that for the record, if we need to reopen the hearing, right? We're no, just being clear. That's we are. I understand. Thank you for the feedback for the commissioners. <laughs> when you do ask a question, you do need to be direct, and for the participants, you need to answer the question and only the question. So, Commissioner Miller. My goodness, a lot of rules. Uh, so if I could have Ms. Brandis and Dan, could you come to the mic? 
because I'm a little concerned about what we're doing here. Um, if we go forward with the proffer of right in, right out at that space on Lakewood, can we show the development plan again? Just so it's, it, I find it helpful. Um, I don't have one. Then we have to do it. Wait, we get it up and so everybody is comfortable. I think that's it. So if you submit the development plan that way, you must do it. You might have some wiggle room, but you have to do it. Even at build out, you're well under that 90 units that requires two access points. Mm -hmm. uh, if you submit the development plan this way, and we get going along here, and you discover that, and the traffic department discovers that, that whatever you thought the good reasons were for that, they find bad reasons, uh, it, we're stuck. And I don't want to cause a delay. But it seems to me we could fix a lot of this if we identified that Lakewood Avenue connection is optional, that you can do it if you want to, but that you don't have to. The code doesn't require it. You don't have to have it there. Uh, and so although it doesn't show on that iteration of the development plan, uh, Mr. Plant's house is, I mean, right there, and he doesn't have much of a front yard. The house next to him, if I'm not mistaken, uh, has its side yard towards Lakewood. The house across the street on Carroll Street at the corner also faces the side. It's their side yard that faces Carroll Street uh, as opposed to facing uh, your, your entrances. And while I don't want to speak for these neighbors, uh, in my own situation, if I lived in any of those houses, I would much rather have the entrance to an apartment complex opposite my side yard than opposite my front of my house. I'm very sympathetic to Mr. Plant's situation. And because of the unusual shape of his lot, he doesn't have an especially deep front yard. Um, and I can imagine, especially if people come and go at night, and they sit there with their lights shining on his house while they wait for an opportunity to turn, whether it's right in or right out. Uh, I, I'm sympathetic to that. I would love to be able to move that entrance or to do away with it altogether. Uh, how important is it to have two access points? We think that the flexibility to have two access points, and, and, and Mr. Miller, I completely agree with you. If there's, and I'm looking at staff, and I, they're probably going to shake their head no, but if there's any way to call out that as an optional driveway, we would jump well, all over that. Funny you should mention that, because I took an opportunity to discuss it with them uh, before I asked my question. Uh, and so I am going to invite you here in front of the mic to say that you would be willing to add that to, that word to your development plan, either in a text commitment or right there on the graphic, and say that that was optional. So that as we go forward, you can work with Mr. Plant and the neighbors to resolve the traffic issues that we've heard here tonight. And I'd, I've driven over there. I drove over again this afternoon. As a matter of fact, it's the last thing I did before I came here. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and I drove around and what have you. I was looking at the property. I was probably causing a traffic hazard uh, rather than looking through the windshield. But uh, you probably didn't even develop the right in, right out thing until after you had seen me driving over there. The, um, but I would like to have, one, give you room to move forward and fix this and all and up to and including eliminating that connection altogether. Uh, I would love also for you to have flexibility to, if, if you decided to get rid of it, to move the other one uh, by widening the, that, uh, how wide your arrow is. But you may have made promises to those Carroll Street neighbors that I don't want to interfere with. So, but if you're willing to put optional on that, I think it would be a vast improvement in your ability to develop the project in the future and to deal with Mr. Plant immediately. Would you, would you do that? Absolutely. So, so what I would do is the wording of um, the access connection, et cetera, et cetera, we would just insert the word optional at the beginning of the text pointing to that driveway connection. 
And staff, just so we're on the same page, I know the conversation happened off the mic. Can you come and confirm that that is an appropriate proffer that can still move forward this evening? Yes, the entire staff agrees over here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. This opens up a whole new world for future development plans, just to let you know. <laughs> so th that seems like a happy ending, but Commissioner Bryan was still waiting to be recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. A brief comment about notifications. I live in South Durham. There's been a lot of development going on around me, and you'd be surprised for a rezoning at 600 feet, and you'd be surprised how short 600 feet can really be. Uh, with respect to the traffic considerations, uh, I just recently finished reading the uh, T.J. Cog raising the roof thing, and uh, it the point one point that came across is that people who need affordable housing, and I think especially for 50% of AMI, might not even own a motor vehicle. And the question I wanted to ask was, based on your experience with what you've done so far, how many of your tenants actually own a motor vehicle? The last time we had a traffic engineer look at this and look at similar properties we developed serving uh, the population that we're focused on here, we found the average vehicle per unit was 0.4, so less than half of those tenants owned a vehicle. Um, so. So that's, you know, that, that's the last time we looked at that. I think that was back in 2014. So we, uh, you know, we have often, we've gone to Board of Adjustment before. We've gone uh, before other bodies and other communities seeking a parking reduction because we don't want to build a big empty parking lot that's going to sit there and collect stormwater and not serve any cars. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do find it's, a, it's smaller than your average population. Okay, that's what I suspected. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that makes that other driveway connection makes the optional even better possible to do. And to me, I, I just don't think the traffic problem here is going to be as bad as it might seem if this was a regular single family development or a regular apartment development or something like that. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we've asked a lot of questions. I actually have two more. And, and then I, I hope we're at the end point. So. <laughs> We talked a lot about traffic. We haven't heard any of your thinking on the construction traffic because that, that's going to be different than the residential traffic. What's your thinking there in terms of where will the access be? We may have just solved it with this proffer that, that you've accepted, but had you thought about the construction traffic and the access? Because that is different than the residential traffic coming and going. Um, well, we, you know, there's already an existing curb cut into the property, and the, most of the property is already paved. Uh, so my expectation is that sort of that would be the staging. There's, you know, the, there's plenty of room for construction vehicles to be, and materials and all that stuff to be inside the property. But the coming and going is what I'm wondering about. Um, yeah, we haven't gotten that far in the process, um, but it would be on that, yeah, I think it would be on Carroll Street at that existing curb cut. Okay, that, that's helpful. I actually think that's, th those neighbors may not be happy to hear me say it, but I think that's a much safer place than on Lakewood to have big trucks coming in and out. So I, I don't think we need any additional commitments there, but that's good to hear. My final question, I think one of the neighbors mentioned that you had talked with them about where you'd be putting the construction debris and the trash and some sort of, did I understand that correctly? Some sort of receptacle with She was talking about a trash for the development. Yeah, the permanent dumpster enclosure. Okay, so that's just something you've worked out with the neighbors and it's not on. Well, yeah, I mean, I know you know our last. My understanding is that the uh, and what I what I said to Carrie and my response is at least based on the last time we did new construction in Durham is that the the UDO is pretty strict about what a dumpster enclosure mm -hmm. would be. So we would anticipate mm -hmm. um, a brick dumpster enclosure with additional screening from of plantings, and it has a gate. So the UDO does address. Um, trash enclosures or, or receptacle enclosures. Mm -hmm. They would have to meet those requirements of site plan. Correct. Okay. So so what you've talked about with the neighbors, though, fits with what is required it's to be met required. at site plan? That's what I just want to make sure. It's not required. At that, can I look? I guess that's a question for staff. Is what, what I heard them commit to sounded like it could be in excess of what's required at the site plan? I don't think they were committing to anything. I I think that the person that spoke was just saying she was glad to know that this is a, a new development would have to meet those requirements. 
Okay. I don't think there was anything actually committed at any point. Mr. Miller, yeah. Commissioner Miller. What follow? is the requirement under the UDO? Must they enclose their trash receptacles? Yes, I'm gonna let Ms. Struthers actually address that because she's uh, an expert at site plans because that's the world she came from. So. <laughs> Talking trash. <laughs> Don't give me that title. Um, so bear with me while I get the actual reference. Um, and, and I should have started by saying, I'm really excited about this proposal. You do great work. I have been on the commission a number of years. I rarely read a proposal and have a big smile on my face and nod my head a lot. So. I just want to make sure that we are addressing some of the concerns that have been brought up tonight. But this is fantastic. Thank you for your work and for the work that everyone with the agency does every day. This is going to make Durham a better place. So really appreciate that. How about, did we buy your time? Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so there are two standards that sort of play into answering that. Um, one being that all solid waste collection facilities shall be designed to prevent windblown debris from leaving the site. And additionally, um, when the service side is visible from the adjacent property line, then it must be uh, screened with um, access doors or gates um, with an opacity of at least 85%. Right. Thank you, that's very helpful. I don't think we have any additional questions. You have run a marathon of questions, so really appreciate it. I think we're at a point of looking for a motion. Commissioner Al Turk. Commissioner Al Turk will take this one. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> This is what happens when you sit closer yeah. to the center. Um, I move that we send case Z180001. Nope, nope, wrong one. Mm -hmm. And he flipped. Yeah, that's it. I think you had it. You got oh, it. Do I have it? Okay. okay. One, eight? No. Yes. 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 You got it. Okay. Um, to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. So moved, uh, and just to say it again, we are moving approval of case Z180018 for approval to the city council. Moved by Commissioner Alturk, seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle. Uh, we'll have a roll call vote, please. With the Commissioner Bryan. With the additional of the word optional in the site entrance. And the right in, right out. And the right out. Yes, that is, Second. that fits with your motion, Commissioner? It Albert? does, it does. Great. Thank you for the clarification. We'll have the roll call vote. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Mill um, <laughs> What? Chair <laughs> Busby? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Motion passes 13 to 0. Thank you all very much. We appreciate you staying here to make sure we deliberate this very carefully. Like all the other cases, this will go to City Council probably in about two months, so we encourage you to stay engaged throughout the process. Uh, that was our final case this evening. Any final updates from staff? Next one. Yeah, we've gotten our next month of uh, um, your um, what to look forward to uh, last month. So if you have any questions about that, just let us know. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>